of Audio Sonic. Accessing Archive 0 2. Archive Title Dead Spaced. April 22nd, 2011. Three men from three countries assemble to discuss the horror of the cosmos. Recording begins. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another installment of Vaudio Sonic. As I said before, this is a little podcasting venture I've wanted to do for a while, unscheduled, unstructured, and based on the idea of wanting to talk about something with some people who are into it as well. Yes, I wrote that intro down on a notepad, so I just read some scripted material. I'm sorry, guys. Um, today, we're going to talk about a really cool game series called Dead Space which I played partly due to one of the guests I have with me here today. So uh, let me introduce my co-host for this evening. Uh, first up is Mr. Jeremy Gogdog. Hello, everybody. What's up? Uh, you are the one who really pushed me into playing Dead Space. Yeah, and you know what's funny is I was pushed into playing Dead Space by our third co-host of the evening. No way. Yes. So we got so, like a, ch- a, a train. Full circle. This is like yeah. a train here. Okay, we well, ran a train on each other. Uh, the other co-host I've got with us this evening is uh, Mister Andy Cobra Commander TFW. Hey guys, what's up? What, what's it like being from the long illustrious line of Cobra Commander TFW family uh, generations? Uh, it feels good. It's uh, you know the honor and the privilege that we we carry with us from our names. Mm. You, you got to strive forward and look to the future. Look to the rising sun. Well, I mean, you guys are, are part of the reason why there's an America today. And, you know, you guys found gold wow. veins out there, and it's good stuff. Yeah, well, they go, gave us Stetsons. Good. <laughs> 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 um, in, in case you're listening to this because I just told you to come and listen to this from YouTube or something like that, um, Gog Dog is one of the folks I do WTF at TFW with. Uh, he likes his Transformers, and he likes his Robots, and he likes his Play Arts Kais, and he likes his Ghosts in the Shells, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And uh, yeah, I'm, I don't tell lies here, but but Andy, Andy Cobra Commander TFW, he comes from a competing Transformers podcast called the yeah. Moonbase Two, where the, true. where everybody's British, and it's it's kind of like this cold alternate universe where there is no America, there is there is just there is the UK, and that kingdom spans across the globe. Well, at one point it did, and you know. In our podcast, we we believe that the empire still lives. One day, the red coast will rise again. You're just you're just waiting for there to be another king of of Britain. Oh yeah, well you know that's what the <laughs> wedding's about, surely. Ha ha ha. Slight Those tangent. Care about but that here. I, I had a bunch of people telling me that they thought the king's speech was just a cheapo cash in on the royal wedding. I was like, what are you talking about? I heard it's a good movie. It's out on DVD, so I go to look for the DVD, and there's this thing called the Royal Wedding Collection Box of a bunch of completely <laughs> irrelevant movies, including the king's speech, that just so happened to be about British royalty. And it's 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 all like, this is to celebrate the wedding. And I'm like, oh, so it is kind of a cash in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we we kind of do that, you know. I'll I'll be honest and say I, I didn't watch the King's speech. I haven't. I, I want to because I heard it was good, but it, most people tell me I should. Well, some Americans tell me I should because <laughs> I'm I'm British and it's your national duty, I, I sir. Must. Yeah, it's like eh, uh. My, what most people don't know about British people is, for the most part, a lot of us don't care about the royal family. That's impossible. It's true. I'm in British I mean, Columbia, and we we worship the Queen every day. I live in a town called Victoria. Um, anyway, uh, we're, we're actually going to talk about Dead Space, uh, which is a fine, yeah. fine series of survival horror games, uh, by the good folks over at Electronic Arts. And, um, I think it's really good. So I, I thought to kick us off, we could just start off talking about Dead Space 1, um, cause that's where the root of it all came from. And, uh, myself, I, I, the thing I really liked about Dead Space 1 just as a game is that, it's called a survival horror game, but it's the most fun I've ever had playing survival horror. Cause usually I don't like survival horror. Cause I feel like part of the, the way things are made tense is that I have trouble moving my character around and I find it a little bit more frustrating than frightening. And in dead space, I'm able to walk around, I can shoot stuff. And, and what I really liked about dead space one is I actually felt very empowered. Uh, I felt about as scary as the necromorphs because they can rip you to shreds and stuff, but I can totally cut their limbs off with mining equipment. And so it's kind of like, it felt like an even game to me. 
um, where I, I didn't feel like I was really at odds with, with the elements so much as as long as I stayed on my toes, I could stand up against all these monsters. And I, th- I thought it was kind of cool. But did, have either of you guys played a, a, a lot of other survival horror to compare this to? Or is this kind of like. I have, as a matter as a matter of fact, I actually just in the last two weeks repurchased uh, Resident Evil 2 and 3 off the PlayStation Network for about six bucks each and played Damn. through all those again. So, yeah, I've, I've, yeah, I've, I've always loved the, the Resident Evil franchise, which kind of mainstreamed the whole genre, I guess. Um, it mm. actually gave it the name survival horror, if I remember correctly, because it says at the beginning of the game, you have, or whenever you load it, you have stepped into the world of survival horror. Good luck every, yes. every time. Mm. Um, there were several games that are considered to be retroactively part of that genre, um, definitely before Resident Evil came along, but I think Resident Evil kind of named the genre and made it a little more mainstream for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, I I like Dead Space and I like Dead Space because it's not like those games and I like those games as well, but they they don't all have to be this, the exact same thing. Uh, several people when Dead Space came out kind of criticized it for not being survival horror enough and it's well, if you if you want to just play those games again, you're you certainly can over and over again. Uh, I I w- was also a huge fan of Resident Evil Four and Five. Uh, Resident Evil Five actually took a lot of slack because it came out just a little after the original Dead Space, and uh, a lot of people made some pretty fair comparisons to the two. Mm. Um, and Resident Evil caught a lot of slack because it didn't introduce some of the control elements for that Dead Space did, um, even though they were kind of very similar, third person over the shoulder. Uh, but the, you know, Resident Evil has its traditions. Um, mm-hmm. And I think certainly in the future, it's going to have to continue to innovate and perhaps move away from some of that stuff. But uh, yeah, I like I, I liked both games a lot, but I, I certainly did like Dead Space and it felt, it felt very, very new and refreshing, but yet still part of that survival horror genre for sure yeah definitely because i mean where, where i'm coming from is like I, I i really love watching survival horror but um and i know it, and, and i don't mean these are bad these are, this is a bad part of it it's just myself i could never really get the hang of stuff like tank controls um for movement and stuff like that so you know like turn and then move forward kind of thing um so that that's one thing I really loved about Dead Space is it, it kind of felt like like this one thing that kind of kept me from really getting into survival horror was gone in Dead Space because it's just like it's an, it's over the shoulder third person and it uses it quite well to to accentuate some horror stuff. Um, but Andy, have you have you played much survival horror outside of Dead Space? Uh, like Gog, uh, I I played uh, Resident Evil the first one and the second one, uh, and really I, I enjoy those ones quite a lot. I was of that age where. Um, no, I was quite young, and ev- everything, even giant two D polygon things running at me, scared the hell out of me, <laughs> which I kind of enjoyed. And giant spiders were always kind of fun. Um, so I played those ones, really enjoyed them. For some reason, I didn't get uh, the third one, and I can't remember why. And after that, I really dropped out of the series for a long, long time. Uh, and then I basically bought a Wii on the basis that people were telling me how good four was, and I was like, if this is the best version of four, I'd like to play it on the uh, it's its best incarnation, and so I played it on there, and again, really enjoyed it. Uh, then 5 came out, and I, I wasn't too impressed with 5. I think it was just... It, it felt a bit too serious compared to 4, which had you running from giant mechanical robots and fighting guys with giant beards with wooden <laughs> eyes, uh, which, which I loved. Uh, so 5 didn't impress me that much, but the apart from that, the only other... I guess survival horror I've played was uh is it is it Project Zero? Uh where you had the, the, the camera and you took pictures of the ghosts to um, kill them. Was that an alternate um, name of it? Because I, I know it is Fatal Frame. Yeah. I think we got it as Project Zero here, but I'm yeah. not entirely sure. Names get changed, but I did play that a little bit and <laughs> unlike Dead Space where like you mentioned, you felt very empowered. I felt very very weak. Uh, on the basis that I had a camera and I was taking mm-hmm. pictures of ghosts, it, it felt like Pokemon Snap, but with ghosts. And yes, it, it, it was Project. That. It was Project Zero in Europe and Australia. Yes, and it was yes. Fatal Frame in America and 
zero zero in Japan or something. So hmm. yeah. okay, cool. Yeah, I, I actually uh, I really like the way Fatal Frame approached things too, because like you said, it's like the opposite. It's it's the, it's the total like you are a little girl with a camera, and you have you have to look first person through the camera at the ghost coming at you. Yeah, and that was freaky. I, I really like what Fatal Frame does, but again, it's it's one of those games I love watching, but I don't know if I could actually get through it myself. <laughs> I don't think I did. I think it was a rental title, which I was like, I'm interested in. And I think I got like through two stages and was like, I'm, I'm done with this. It's, it's a bit too tanky. Yeah. That's, and, and I, a lot of people I find really come down on tank controls in hindsight. They're like, Oh, you remember those clunky tank controls and survival horror games? But it's like, um, I always believed the, the, the case that I, I saw made that tank controls were kind of part of what makes those games a little bit more intense because you have to think about when you move. It kind of mm. It's kind of like you have to put a lot of thought into your movement. So if you get scared or spooked by something, you'll have trouble actually moving because you're, you're going to – it's kind of a way to represent your body getting frozen a bit with fear and that if the player is getting nervous, they have to also still be thinking like I have to turn and move forward and then keep track of how I'm moving. And uh, it adds something yeah, for to sure. it. It, yeah, um, definitely. But but as a control scheme, it also for me was it ended up being a bit of a turnoff just because I couldn't get into it. Um, yeah, I, and and I I I really viewed those games with rose colored glasses, and I always kind of wanted to go back and play them. I was very afraid that in this day and age they would be unplayable for me, especially after playing more modern incarnations of from that series. Mm. So when I when I popped into and uh, and played it. I was very surprised. That I I had a lot of fun. I went went right from two into three, and uh, went back and did stuff like I I didn't when I played it. Like in uh, Resident Evil Three, you fight this creature called the Nemesis that basically follows you through the entire game, and yeah, you in all but a handful of of times that happens, you have the option to fight him or run. And unless you're an ex- an experienced player you oftentimes don't even sometimes have the ammo to fight. Uh, so you, you would, you, you really, you literally can't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but I, I made a, an effort this time. I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to try to do it. And I, I ended up doing it and I had a blast. I, I think those games are, yeah. are still really fun. Um, Resident Evil three made a little bit of an innovation, at least for the series in that it gave you a quick 180 degree turnaround. Yeah. Um, which all the Resident Evils, as far as I know, have used since then, where you just type, you hit the, you, you, you tap back and run, and your character will do a 180 so you can run away instead of having to tank all the way around before, really slowly before you can run. That would help me so, out a lot, I think, too. Cause that, that, yeah. Dead Space does that as well, which, which definitely yeah. helps. It, it's nice because it, it also, it's, it's still, um, it's kind of, it's kind of still, it's not immersion breaking, because it's just literally the character whipping around to run away. And, mm. I always felt like that was a little bit of an immersion thing for me too. Is is when you had to tank 180 degrees? That's when I start going like ah, like I just want to turn around. <laughs> um, but going back to Dead Space, uh, Dead Space One, um, I did not play until this year. Um, I basically did did a little bit of a Dead Space marathon of one extraction and two, and uh, damn, that was a fun marathon. But uh, just, I guess, in general, just some thoughts on Dead Space One from you guys, like what you liked about it, um, maybe even what what you felt was a bit weak in it. Um, like I said, I I just love the controls and the gameplay uh, primarily. Like I love I loved a lot of things about it, but at its core, I found it a fun game to play, and I think that's why I really liked sticking with it. But um, uh, let's start at the root of this, I guess. Andy, what what drew you into Dead Space? Uh, well, I think what first uh, turned me on to it was. I'd either seen a trailer on... I, I can't remember if Giant Bomb had launched at this point. I think it had, hadn't it? I want to say if yes. it was, it, was I, it must have been Giant Bomb that had drawn me to it, because those guys know how to review games, if you don't know. Uh, and I was like, hell, I'll, I'll check it out. And I watched the, the trailers and stuff, and it looked really interesting. Uh, the, the futuristic setting was a nice change of pace from the more... I say in quotation marks, realistic setting that Resident Evil was. Mm-hmm. And I like crazy space stuff. I like it when space in the future is kind of dark and foreboding. And it, it couldn't get much more dark and foreboding than this. Uh, it, the trailers were really, really creepy with that twinkle, twinkle, little star thing. Yeah. And the, the imagery that they showed and all that and everything about the look of it and the feel of just the trailer drew me into it and got me started playing it. And 
as soon as I started getting into the the actual game, because it took me a while. Because I'll be honest, I was a little bit scared to start playing it. I was like, ooh, oh, it's it's kind of dark outside, and uh, <laughs> if I play this game, I'm gonna do it without the lights on. I'm gonna do it with the surround sound on. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna fully immerse myself. And once I once I got past the the first couple of jump scares, uh, I was like, okay, now now. I'm a bit more prepared. Not to say that it didn't make me jump a lot as I played through it, because they they know how to uh, lead your eyes with with um, flickering lights or quick movements off screen mm-hmm. or or sounds. They they were really good at making that that atmosphere deep and thick. Absolutely, um, and, and like I was actually in the same position going in. I only played Dead Space at night. Um, and uh, I did have that thing where, like, just starting the game off, I was like, all right, I know there's going to be jump scare. I was expecting jump scares and stuff because that's, you know, mm. it's, it's part of survival horror games. And I was like, all right, I got to get like, I actually had to do like, all right, here we go. Just we're going to I, I kind of just like close my eyes. and went like, let's go. I just held forward. I'm like walking in. Let's <laughs> let's just do it. It's really bad. That first one as well, because obviously oh, I, it's I would, the. Um, yeah, the- <laughs> it, uh, what What is it? The uh, the in, the environmental system goes off or some decon. No, it's decon. And the one drops uh, drops down and goes for the the spare soldier. And you're like, dude, yeah, dude behind you. And the whole time I was like, well, it's a video game trope. I'm going to watch them get slaughtered and then I'll go find my weapon and go in there and deal with the monsters. But no, yeah. then monsters break into the room you're in and you have no weapon. And oh, I was, you gotta run. <laughs> and that, that was already, that was the first genius move of that game, was like, they, yep. they put you in danger, and all you can do is run, and if you don't run, you will actually get killed. And I was like, mm. this is awesome, because Kendra's going like, run! And I'm like, I'm running! <laughs> Lady, I'm getting out of here! Um, I love the opening of, of that game. Uh, really puts you into it. it. It helped me get over the hump, too, because I was like, alright, that's probably the biggest scare I'm going to have for the next hour. So, I'm pumped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. No, uh, really well done. Um, let's let's go over to Gog here now. Uh, Gog, what what drew you into Dead Space One? Um, si- similarly, actually, it was again probably Giant Bomb. They were, uh, I think, Brad Shoemaker over there was really talking up how much he loved the second one. Mm-hmm. Um, go leading up to its release, and I was like, you know, if it's if it is really that amazing. Um, and it, it had actually been out for a few days as well. And then people I know personally on the internet were talking about how amazing the game was. And I'm like, wow, if this is really a AAA title that that's this good, I'm, I'm going to have to, to grab me a copy of this. And um, Andy ah. here was uh, talking it up a little bit. And he liter- I think he literally asked me three times a day until I finally bought it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, yeah, uh, Chris. I, I, yeah, yeah. I you know how well that's be, like. I, oh man, yeah, I taught I, you so well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but what was funny was because everybody was saying like, well, if you hadn't played the first one, it has like a little uh, thing in the a movie in the beginning that says previously on Dead Space. So I I had asked several times on Twitter and other places like, you know, should I should I just watch that? Because everybody was saying that the second game was better than the first in almost every way. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, if it if it's a better game, you know, I sh- and if and if it tells you what happened previously, then I should be set, right? I should I could be able to jump right into the cycle and it'd be fine. So I asked several people and the vast majority of people said, "No, dude, you got to play the first one. The first one is a great game." So I said, "Okay." Um ended up buying it on Steam and uh popped it in, started it up like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this game is really cool. Um, it's it, and a revel, a kind of a revelation I just had while we were talking about the movement schemes and everything is it's funny because again, like, well, just making like the 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 uh, contrast to Resident Evil Five. Resident Evil Five, for the most part, has tank controls. It, it allowed you to strafe when you weren't aiming your weapon. Um, but a lot of the environments in Resident Evil 5 are a little a little more wide open. Um, you have the the more advanced movement schemes in Dead Space, mm-hmm. but especially in Dead Space 1, most of the time you are in very cramped situations. 
which is kind of uh, that's kind of an interesting uh, design choice, I think, because you ha- you can walk around in all directions while you shoot, uh, but most of the areas you're in are fairly tight. So yeah. the the advantage of having that is it it you, there's still certainly it, it's certainly the advantage to being able to do that, but you 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 also still have to navigate your terrain fairly strategically as well well i I wonder if maybe that that almost that that accentuates uh dead spaces controls in that you have such you have so much control and such a small space to operate in that you never hit any kind of boundaries where if you're in a wide enough open space you may be like oh i wish i could turn a bit faster or strafe a bit harder than this whereas in those corridors it's just like you it's like i within the space of these confines i am wiry and able to move wherever i want I mean, mm-hmm. while being in a clunky engineer suit. Right. But much like Andy, I was really fascinated by the the sci-fi aspect of it. You know, it's it's mm. out in it's out in space and you're in this ship and it, it it all the whole process just seems well thought out from a from a design point and all oh, the sound and everything and uh it's just I don't know. It's it's so good. And the fact that you're on this ship, which is basically for the most part out of commission, just re- really leads into these awesome situations of darkness and creepy lighting and weird mechanical sounds. Uh, there's There was this one part where you go down an elevator, and as soon as you open up the elevator, there's like steam vents that are screaming at you. Yes. So you you're you're welcomed you're welcomed to the opening doors of the elevator by screaming, and it took my brain I think a good two and a half seconds. To finally process the fact that there was not some creature in front of me that was screaming at me like a banshee trying to blow my eardrums out. Um, yeah, just really cool, really cool. Um, uh, the, the sound design of Dead Space, I think, is definitely a real big part of it. Um, it's a game where if you don't have good speakers, then get some headphones. Because mm. it, it, that will help you immerse really well. Um, I just want to throw in, I'm kind of in the same position where part of what kind of, aside from everyone on Twitter sort of talking about it at the time when Dead Space 2 came out, part of what drew me in was uh, Brad Shoemaker's comments about how much he loved Dead Space 2, because I was kind of like, wow, if he loves it that much, it, it, I, I would hope there's something in there that I could dig, so I, I want to check it out, and um, I was kind of I was kind of following Gog's lead a little bit, because um, I had just been looking into Assassin's Creed, where a lot of people will say, you don't really need to play Assassin's Creed 1. You can just skip it and pl- start playing at number 2 because the gameplay is so much advanced in 2 that playing number 1 is almost a bit of a drag by comparison. Um, so Dead Space 1 is one of those cases where it's almost the opposite. It's like, no, Dead Space 1 is a solid game. Dead Space 2 is a, is a, a, probably a better game, but that by no means is a slight against Dead Space 1. Dead Space 1 yeah. is already really good and should it, be played. It, 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 it's also a, a different game too. Whereas, mm. and I, I, get, I haven't played any Assassin's Creed, but what I assume is, is they got their kind of basic engine down, what they wanted to accomplish, and Assassin's Creed Two did it just better. It was the mm-hmm. it was the same ga- for the most part. It was the same game. You're still doing the same things. You're just doing it better. The game is well better designed. Uh, that sort of thing. But th- while Dead Space and Dead Space 2 are certainly in the same series, uh, they share so much th- together, both design-wise, gameplay-wise. They're also, they also have a lot of differences, too, that mm-hmm. I think are really important. Whereas in Dead Space 1, me and Andy were talking about this last night because they made they definitely made a certain design choice in the first one to have a silent protagonist. Um, in the second game, they threw that out for a, a well-developed character. I mean, well, mm-hmm. I mean, a developed character. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I just, you know, he's, he's not a bad sp- character. I don't want but... to speak in hyperbole. I just want to, yeah. they, 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 mm-hmm. cre- they created a character in dead space two in dead space one. It was silent, which let you as the player experience that. And and I I do think it's two different experiences for the most part. Mm-hmm. You, you 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 don't have okay. You, you know that Isaac has a loved one on the ship, um, uh, Nicole Brennan. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're you're not really living out for the most part 
Isaac's wishes, his desires, or anything. It's he's just your avatar as you're as you're running around, and uh, it's it, it's a very creepy game because and also in the in the first Dead Space, you just you don't know, you don't know anything. The only thing you know is that you docked on a ship. These crazy creatures that look like they're made out of human body parts are coming at you, and you don't you don't know anything. And by the end of the game, you you know quite a bit more, but you you don't know what's around the next corner because you have you have no idea until towards the end what even caused this. Um, and in Dead Space Two, you do know all that, and and it's more of a there's more fiction there, I think, because they they and it's almost it's almost jarring at first. When after you've played Dead Space One, when you play Dead Space Two, because suddenly Isaac, who was nothing more than just an avatar for you in the first game, is now like uh, Sam from Splinter Cell, or uh, mm. is that his name, Sam? I think so, Sam Fisher. So yeah, yeah. Um, or and what's his name from uh, Nolan North from? Uh, you basically Nolan North. Yeah, for one short. <laughs> but but th- those are games that are that are third third person games that you're controlling them, but you're controlling a character. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, Isaac went from this kind of silent avatar for you experiencing this as a player to you kind of leading this character along, much like those other games. Uh, so I, I think they're two completely different experiences. Even though they, Dead Space Two certainly did make a lot of improvements on the gameplay. Um, and and really up the ante for what they were trying to do. It's also, it's also, it's 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 a different enough game to to where you you will get a different experience out of Dead Space One versus Dead Space Two, which mm-hmm. may again I haven't played Assassin's Creed, but I kind of get the impression that that's not as much the case between those two games. Yeah, I just know that that when Dead Space or uh, sorry, yeah, when Dead Space Two came out, um, especially with that retrospective clip they put in, um it was tempting to just go into dead space two and skip the first one. But um, it's very rewarding to play both. And there are parts of dead space two where you won't know why, why something's happening uh, just for, for brief moments. There, there are a lot of, th- there's a, a part in dead space two with a lot of throwbacks to dead space one. And if you haven't played the first one, it will make no sense. And it will be kind of unfulfilling, I think uh, to go through that part. But um, no, dead space one was, um, it was a really good experience, I think. And and what's what's amazing to me is when I played Dead Space 1, I have this a lot with games, but because I don't play tons of games every year, um, I thought for a game that's a couple years old now, it held up really well, too. Uh, Dead Space 1 doesn't feel like an older 360 game. It feels pretty... Uh, it feels like something that if it was released like this year, I probably would say, like, that's pretty cool. And uh, I, I really dug it. Uh, also, the, I guess another thing you could talk about in Dead Space 1 would be... Uh, the storyline, which is always kind of a crux of some survival horror experiences is eventually you need to have a reason why everything's happening. And, uh, dead space one has a pretty neat little science to it in the form of the marker, uh, which uh, having read through dead space wikis and whatnot and, and recaps of storylines, it, it is sort of still in that realm where things are vague enough so that people are more so working on theories than outright facts. But, uh, you have these markers, these, uh, these, it was an alien artifact, but these man-made copies of an alien artifact that seems to perhaps be alive, like some form of organic AI, and uh, it causes um, necromorphs, which are, uh, as Gog said, like the bodies of human beings kind of reworked into uh, practical forms uh, whose main purpose is to collect more necrotic flesh to turn into more necromorphs. Um, which, which is a really cool concept because basically it gives you very horrific looking monsters that are not just outright zombies, but still have that rather disturbing hint of human to them. Um, which, which I think is kind of accentuated by at least in dead space too, as I understand it, the art team did a lot of research into like how the human biology works and decays and, and can be broken, uh, in order to make the, the necromorphs look quote unquote realistic. So that if a human being were to suddenly have their neck stretch out and then their jaw bisect into mandibles and stuff, like it, they tried to make it look like what would actually happen, which I think really helps because there's there's some real creep factor to necromorphs, mm. um, especially in their eyes, man. I know Andy, how, how do you feel about some of the story in Dead Space or just like the necromorphs in general? Uh, when we're talking about the the marker specifically, are we gonna 
talk about what we learn in Dead Space 2 or are we going to leave that until we, we get to the Dead Space 2 section? Because we learn a lot of interesting things about the marker in Dead Space 2. Mm. Um, I guess for now, let's, let's just stay on what we know in Dead Space 1, just so that okay. there's a bit of order to how we're going about it. But. Yeah, what one I will mention on the necromorph subject uh, the the difference between the necromorphs in one to two is is strangely staggering. Just on the uh, the base of the the transformation scene between a normal human body to a necromorph in one was uh, I wouldn't say jarring, but it was a bit quick. Mm-hmm. While in Dead Space Two, they you could tell they went out of their way to make that animation look really freaky, and it 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 worked. It that animation sequence between them being the human body and the infector infecting them and changing them was really <laughs> interesting just to watch from an animation perspective because that was creepy. Yeah, that's very creepy. Um, all of the the actual enemy types in in uh, in Dead Space One anyway were. They were interesting, like you had your generic necromorph with its little uh, arms and, and pointy arms and stuff, and then you had slightly faster ones, and then later on in the game you got hyper-speed ones. The Twitchers! The Twitchers, uh, that's right. Those th- yeah. oh, I hated them. Those, there, there's this one part in Dead Space 1, and I know this it probably wasn't scripted, it's just a case of some good luck, but there's this one part where literally... I thought I'd cleared the room out. I was standing there reloading and picking up items, and then I turned around, and there's literally a twitcher who was just standing behind me twitching. And, <laughs> and he hadn't attacked me yet, because they have a bit of an attack cycle to what they do. So it's some, something like, I just, I had, he had come up behind me, and I just turned around in time to see him just standing there twitching at me, and I was staring at him for a good two seconds, and he smacked me in the face. I was like, oh god! And started the fight <laughs> up again. But th- those twitchers were friggin'... Like, there's a great evolution to, to the enemy reveals, I think. Oh yeah, yeah. Because of course, not th- those are just the. I guess they're the the most humanoid of the necromorphs, right? Somewhat, yeah. Because they're they're, yeah. they're freshest, I think. I guess. Yeah, I think that's the best way to describe them. Because you get you have that basic one, and then you have a black variation, which is a much harder version to dismember and to kill in general. Mm-hmm. Then you had the the babies, which I thought that was. A very bold move for them to go with, because I, I'm, I was sure as soon as I heard you could kick a dead baby, that mothers would be screaming and complaining of the horrors of dead space and child abuse. And I'm glad it didn't go down that road. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, there, there's, there's ways to do it, and and those, uh, what were they called? Like they're the ones with the tentacles that that can shoot yeah, at I, you. Um, I, do you know what the name is, Gok? I, I don't know. I can't um. Oh, look, hold on. Yeah. I mean, I mean, to to use babies as necromorph basis uh, material, I think you know it, it's some some would say it's a bit of a cheap scare or a cheap creep, but I think there's a bit of ballsiness to it because you know it's it's kind of it's kind of a hard subject to approach without knowing you're taking a big risk, and I think that they ran with it pretty well with those things because they are creepy as hell. Um, and it's legitimate crawlers. as well. Crawlers. crawlers. Yeah. Oh, oh man. no, no, no! Wait, crawler was from the second one. Hold on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, the crawlers were the babies in the second one, but. Uh... These these are the ones that can snipe you with that the great yeah. one of the lurker f- lurkers a lurkers first yeah. time you see one you finally see a living crew member of the Ishimura and <laughs> dude gets his hand nailed to a to a window with with a lurker dart that was a good reveal I think but yeah just to yeah to they they really went all out on a lot of creep factors um I won't argue if someone says that they were trying a bit hard by using babies but I think that see I don't think that I think it's legitimate because it no, was it is a legit, family sure. ship yeah it's like well what would happen to the children and the babies on board it's like would the would the insanity not spread to them as well or w- yeah. would people not kill the babies it's like I don't think people for me anyway I I guess I could potentially see where they're coming from but I don't think they have much of a basis to stand on because yeah, it's a family I, ship. Yeah, I would I would say like you know if you're gonna say on a design standpoint to have baby zombies is is kind of an easy creep. I'm like, well, yeah, it's an easy yeah. creep, but they legitimize it really well, and yeah. those things are a legitimate. They're they're a type of enemy the game needs because they're a ranged enemy. Um, they're a small one, so they're they're harder to see and hit. Um, and and they are also they play to a lot of creep because well the first time you see one, especially if you didn't clearly see it through the window in its reveal, you'd be like, oh, it's a little baby slug thing. I'll just, I'll just go deal with this. Then three huge bladed tentacles come out of its back, and you're like, oh, god. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, like, they are the worst when they sneak up on you, because if, if they get a bead on you, right, you don't know that they're there. Suddenly you have these darts coming at you from every direction. 
and you're like, oh, hell, there's babies crawling on the walls. They were really annoying in the, the zero-G areas, oh, I will say. Yeah. Especially when they were far away, because they could, they, like you said, they could snipe you, and <laughs> you were just looking around for the, the missile trails to just to kind of go, oh, God, where are they? And trying to get he'd hear them. Trying to get a beat on them is the worst at a long range, because <sighs> they, they, they do need a while to get a lock on you, but if you don't know they're there, they will get a lock on you before you get a lock on them. And if you're shooting at them with the line gun, because that's usually what people would do, because it's like, hey, one shot will detentacle them. It's good. Line gun takes a little while to get there, and I always had this happen. Maybe just because I was too slow. Every time, I'd be like, all right, at long range, line gun lined up, fire. It's heading towards them. Right before it hits them, they crawl away, or they, they suck their tentacles back in. And I'm like, you little... <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming over there. <laughs> um, Gog, what about you? How did you, how did you feel about uh, some of the lore and, and just the necromorphs of, uh, of Dead Space 1? Um, the actual game is was fascinating. I think the build up to what you see at the end is is just mind blowing. I think when I first saw the marker, I think I just stared at it for a long time. Mm -hmm. It was just creepy, especially when you get closer and closer to it, the thing just you just hear voices chanting in your head. It's just it's just nuts. Um and just he hearing the uh and, and again like I guess in the in the fictional world of Dead Space, like everyone knows who unitologists are. Mm -hmm. They seem to be like the pro the prominent religion of humanity in that in that period of, of fiction. Um, so, but as a player, you really I guess you don't know that much about it until you get further into the game. But the I th I, th I think the way it was handled in the first game was was great. I think the way the way it ended, um, and all the the mystery surrounding the marker and the conspiracy behind them locating it and doing excavation to 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 pull it up under the guise of like human you know helping humanity and everything was mm -hmm. was 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 really cool. Um, un unfortunately, I think some of the experience is lessened by some of the ancillary fiction. Um, one really good example of how to do it right, I would say, is with Mass Effect, where you have the lead writer of the game who is actually penning the comic books by himself. And everything is just in lockstep with one another, and you know that th th if this isn't just official canon that has been approved by someone. It's coming from the same minds that make it. Um, unfortunately, I, like because I had, I've seen some of the 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 Dead Space fiction outside of the games, and it just I I don't think it's as good to put it mildly. Yeah, um, I mean I've I've heard it's, that the the novel is okay. But um, I've heard a lot of trash talk on on the comic books and uh, and a lot of trash talk on the animated movies. That mm -hmm. uh, and 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 having seen parts of the first one, I see why. <laughs> I think I think my main complaint from what I've from from what I've seen and from what I've read about is it just seems to me that they 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 almost I would say maybe they almost reveal too much and what they mm. do reveal. Is seems to be in a very kind of understated fashion, where yeah. you, you don't seem to have any. They're they're telling you important things as far as like the backstory of the markers and and things like that, and it it just seems to really fall flat. Um, and then you wonder if any of the stuff like should be considered canon because I, like we had talked about um, earlier. There, there was a piece of dead space fiction that said that the marker was surrounded by a quote unquote dead space, um, which the necromorphs couldn't get near. But in the game, <laughs> that's not true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's just you, you kind of wonder. So I, I tend to just kind of, for the most part, I think ignore that, um, and just uh, just enjoy what I've seen in the games and the fact that, okay, like the the the, the red marker from the first game was basically. Uh, I guess they had found another marker on Earth many years ago, um, and the government decided to reconstruct it or make the they copied it and made their own. 
Um, and when they made their own, it somehow activated. Uh, um, but the fact that no one really knows where these things are from and <laughs> they, they drive people insane and like have like maps to reconstruct alien cells. And then <laughs> of course any scientist is going to be like, Oh cool. I can do that. And then yeah. hilarity ensues. <laughs> so, uh, but the fact that it's also mysterious and it's, I, yeah, I, I, I was totally enthralled with everything leading up to finding and even afterwards with, with the marker and just the mysteriousness around it. But it wasn't, it wasn't just like you finding like this thing and you're going to put it in your backpack and carry it around with you. It's just this giant monolith that chants into your brain is just, ugh, it was just so, so creepy and ominous and, mm-hmm. Yeah, I I I I think story wise in in the first game they just really knocked it out of the park. Well, they they definitely set up a story that left you wanting more in a good way, and uh, and I agree with you. It's it's kind of like it's almost like the uh, it's like if Mass Effect didn't go quite as well, where there's a, this, the game has so much good story potential, and then Mass Effect's ancillary fiction really tapped into that. Whereas Dead Space is it's still kind of like I would equate it maybe to some of the Silent Hill ancillary fiction that's come out where people try to run with the Silent Hill concept in comic books and whatnot, and it it always kind of, or in film even, and it comes off kind of like, they kind of get it, and you can tell they want to get it, but it doesn't quite have the same effect. Or it does that thing, and I like how you put it actually, where it reveals reveals too much in an almost like nonchalant kind of way. Like, did you know that the marker's actually this? Anyway, the story is going to continue like this. And uh, if if Dead Space ever really locks down some of that that non-game fiction, I think they could have a really good franchise going because it's a very cool concept, the marker, and uh, and Dead Space Two totally taps into that concept really well. And I'm I'm looking forward to should they do a, another Dead Space game, which I'm I'm sure they will. Uh, if they can run with that concept as well as they have in the games, it it should be a good time. But um, yeah, I I, I really dug the the reveal on the marker I, I really liked that it wasn't something you could just pick up and carry with you you had to like cart it around on giant mining equipment platforms and and go through decontamination rooms and stuff like that um which kind of leads me to another point i wanted to bring up which is in, in dead space one of the things that i think it does really well as a survival horror game even though we talked about it having jump scares and there are jump scares it doesn't rely on jump scares nearly as much as one might think and a whole lot of its horror actually comes from really long stretches of the game where you see no necromorphs. Uh, it, it's so good at, at building the tension by constantly making you, like, it'll put you through, like, a lengthy action sequence of, like, fighting, you know, 5 to 25 necromorphs. And then by the end of it, you're just so like, oh, man, where's the next one going to come out? And then you might play in upwards of 20 minutes without ever seeing another one, but you're never calm that whole time. The, the, or at least in, the, on your first playthrough, you probably won't be, because the game is so good at giving you that uh, that feeling of dread the whole time where you're like you you can hear them in the walls you can see them flitting around corners but that's what's so good about it is that it uh, it doesn't just rely on a lot of jump scares that that you might be able to predict by the time you play the game a second time and I think that's what makes dead space and dead space 2 uh, such replayable games as well is that a lot of their good points don't rely on you not having played through it before Um so I don't know, like, uh, Andy, how'd, how'd you feel about the ambience in, in the game? Did you get that feeling from it, or...? Uh... Oh, definitely. That, like I uh, said near the start, that's what actually drew me to it when I, that trailer set the ambience up. Uh, and throughout the game, like you said, there are long stretches of no necromorphs, but they're sometimes interspersed with some really disturbing imagery, like uh, at one point you're going down a hallway and you can see a guy who you think is alive off in the distance, just like through a doorway, hitting his head off like a, I love that off part. a wall. Yeah. yeah, that's really cool. And you go up to him, and I, I, I remember thinking, oh, thank God, I found a survivor. Okay, he may be a little bit crazy, but at least he's alive. Get up to him, he smashes his head really hard against the wall. You hear a, <laughs> his skull crack, and he falls to the floor, and he's, he's missing his chest. And I'm like, oh... Yeah, he didn't make it. There's a lot of parts I remember like that, and I think these were in Dead Space One, where it's like you you find uh, you find the lady in the in in the ho- in the surgery area of the oh, hospital. Yeah, you've just been hearing all her audio logs about how she's surviving, but she's afraid someone's coming after her and stuff like that. And you get in there, and she's cutting open the guy she thought was going to kill her, and then she cuts her own throat open. And you're like, yeah, while laughing. <laughs> yeah, or or when you find the lady in, uh, I think this is in Dead Space One, you find the lady in uh, among all the dead bodies in the storage area laughing, and then she shoots her own head off. Yep. 
And or the, the one that gives you the kinesis who's missing her eyes, and she's like, hey, you finally came for me, I knew you wouldn't leave me. Oh yeah, and, I forgot about that. It's, yeah, it's, and she's she's surrounded by the dead bodies as well. You hear her, you hear her, a lot of them have a you know they, a lot of them tap into that system shock thing or, or nowadays Bioshock most people will call it of having the audio logs uh, to set up some story stuff and it does it really well because often you'll hear these audio logs and you'll find the person who recorded them and sometimes you'll find them alive briefly and <laughs> most of the time it's very briefly yeah and I like the fact that that it's not outright that person but if you've been listening to the logs and reading them it you can tell it's them yeah which is a nice thing that they threw in and obviously uh, another cool thing that they did is space like when you're in the vacuum of space uh i think this has been the first game i've ever played where when i've been in space there's been no sound yeah or, or when you hear sound it's based on what you'd hear inside your suit yeah. So, like, if something smacks into you, you'll hear a dull thud, and, and and that makes the space parts so nicely chilling because, like, 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 like we said, you don't actually fight necromorphs constantly throughout the game. So there's parts where you're in space where you don't see any necromorphs, but then when you do, you you don't hear them um, mm-hmm. until usually until they've actually hit you, or if you you are lucky enough to see them in front of you when they pop out. And usually they're also the spookier ones, like the babies that shoot stuff, or the ones whose legs have become a giant scorpion tail and are crawling around on their on their hands. I hate um, them. And, oh man, yeah. <laughs> Just going back a little bit, one thing that I think it does so well because some people have criticized that, you know, the stronger enemies are just reskinned versions of the existing ones. But this is something from Half-Life 2. When you take something and then you skin it to basically have, like, basically pitch black, crust, crusty stuff on its skin, and then you give it red eyes, it, it for some reason, spooks me out even more. It's kind of like the uh, the black head crabs from Half-Life 2, where there's head crabs, and it's like, all right, I can deal with these head crabs. Then there's, like, a fuzzy black one that hisses, and it makes me think of, like the kind of insects I would never want to see. Like, the ones that just look, like, necrotic. <laughs> and uh, and so the, the, the dark necromorphs kind of give, gave me that feel of the black head crabs from Half-Life 2, of, like, there's necromorphs, then there's the ones who are covered in, like, black, pustuly nastiness and are twice as strong. I don't know. It, it kind of worked for me. It, 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 all these times, these are things that I would totally go like from a distance. Like, you know, there's probably a cheese factor to this, but Dead Space is so good at presenting it that you, you buy right into it and you get freaked out by it uh, while it's happening. Um, and obviously in Dead Space 2, they kind of build on that because didn't they give a reason for the black ones existing as well? I, I, I believe so. Um, yeah. A lot of a lot of this stuff, is it's, it's all mushing together in my head, so I can't pull it right out of my... Uh, right out of my memory, but I, I, I want to say that you're right there. Um, but Gog, what about you? How do you feel about the, uh, the ambience of dead space, how it, it sort of enhanced things to a degree? Oh, it, it was, it was genius. I think, and I think that's one of the cool things about it was being on the ship. Like you're, it's an industrial area and you just have, you have like that, that can be creepy in and of itself. Like you're flying into a ship there's no one around. Like, there's no one to save you. You're just out in the middle of of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Um, and the you're you're in this this kind of industrial environment, and there's just all these sounds around you that are, and especially when you're in different parts of the ship, they really play that up uh, uh, quite well. Um, I would say playing, especially the first Dead Space was the first game in a long time. It was actually, I had situations just like you had said a few minutes ago where you, you're like, okay, I'm going to play some dead space tonight. I'm super excited. You start the game. You, you're looking at the load button and you're like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. Yeah. You got to get over that hump. <laughs> like, Cause you're like, I know that I'm yes. about to go into a world that is uncompromisingly creepy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I gotta and, get ready for this. Like you gotta go. Like, yeah, and it's it, oh, it's right, all. Right. It was all like it would all it would be all I'd think about all day. Like, oh man, I totally like beat chapter nine or whatever last night. I can't wait to I can't or whatever. I I can't wait to to go into the next part. It's gonna be crazy. I know something crazy is coming up. You know, you you dream about playing it. You're you're at work and you're like, oh man, I can't wait to go home and play it. Yeah. You you get home and you're like, oh man, it, it's that first step. <laughs> <laughs> and, and finally, yeah, you just you got to you just got to go, and you're like, yeah, and and like that was fun for me because I'm like, when is the last time that a game has ever done this to me? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was it was so good, and it, it and again, I never 
I never felt like the enemies were going to just overpower me and kill me unfairly. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I always, I always felt like I had the right equipment to, to take care of any situation, you know, unless you, the few, the rare times when you, when you'd run out of ammo and then you, then you were just Boned. scared shitless. <laughs> but the, uh, yeah, it was, yeah. I mean, and I don't know if I can even place why exactly that happened on any one or two design elements. It was just everything worked together so well. Um, and again, it was the fact that, I, this was a new franchise for me. I, I literally, like, even halfway through the game, I, I didn't know what was around the next corner because you don't, you still don't really know what's causing this. There has to be something bigger behind this. Um, and I'm, you're always kind of worried about, are you going to see, are you going to see something like that along, around the next corner? So, um, and one, going back on what, when you guys were, was talking about before, the, um, the whole, uh, I can't remember exactly what one you said, but it made me think about it is the most, most of the games that you play nowadays, you're just aiming for the head. Mm -hmm. Um, Jeff, you know, we've, we've mentioned giant bomb a few times that we're all fans of, of, of giantbomb.com and those guys. Um, one thing that the Jeff Gersman says fairly often on the giant bomb cast is headshots have ruined video games. Um, and I can totally understand where he's coming with that because it's, you're always having to aim, aim for the head, aim for the head, aim for the head. And it takes, it kind of takes some of the joy out of just going and playing the game. Mm -hmm. Um, the, and especially when they add achievements there, because then they're forcing you to do it instead. And it's really not realistic, uh, for the most part, but, I mean, I understand why it's there. I mean, every everybody has to have a weak point, uh, but the uh, it was so it's so genius how Dead Space handles it, and you're not. And, and again, like the tension, like we were talking about with the the tank controls and and all that stuff, kind of artificially building tension. But maybe yeah. artificially is a bad word, but. Well, it, it tries. It tries to to build. It tries to to add in a representation of attention that right. at the they, time yeah. you couldn't otherwise feel as a player because there, there was no tech for it. Yeah, correct. Mm. Um, and I think Dead Space does that really well in that. Yeah, enemies are coming at you. If you just shoot them in the head or even decapitate them, it's only going to piss them off even more. Yeah, you you have to systematically disassemble your opponent. While he is running at you with giant claws, hoping to rip your face apart, um, you're not just aiming for the body and putting as many rounds as possible into him with a machine gun as you run backwards. You are slowly walking backwards and having to systematically disassemble him until there's not enough pieces left for him to continue walking or slashing at you. Yeah, and, and it's, it's so genius. What's so good about it too, and this is how this is how the game adds some tension in such a good way is you have to do that, and then when you're in a room with multiple ones. It's utterly natural to get fixated on the one that you're you're dismembering and go like I got to cut his legs off now his arms now the tentacle and while you're doing that if you get too fixated on one other ones will get you and so it becomes a case of like you got to be aware like that's why having such good controls helps that game so much because you have really good controls you're in full control of Isaac but you have to be aware of your surroundings you can't just focus on one necromorph at a time you have to be aware of what's coming at you which types are coming at you like do you full full on dismember one at a time or do you just take out legs to slow them all down then get back to to the the most dangerous one first um, it's really good at, and like you said, you know, you have all the tools you need aside from running out of ammo, you basically are fully ready to deal with the situation. It's just down to you as a player now and your skills. And I think that's great because it, it doesn't yeah. mean you you can never in dead space, you can never go, oh, well, it's the game's fault because I didn't have this or the, the controls didn't work right. It's all down to you and your skills. Yeah. It, it was just so refreshing though, of just not. I'm going to take my automatic gun and I'm going to put as many rounds into the middle as that one. Then I'm going to do the same thing to this one. And if he's close enough and I have good enough aim, I'll just aim for the head. It's the, there ain't none of that. It's, and it's, but while these, while these things are like running towards you and hissing and growling and yeah, it's like, it's, yeah, it's so good. And when you have like five of them, yeah, you're, you're going to look like if I, I'm going to cut the leg off this one. He can't run at me anymore. 
He's still going to be coming, just slower. That'll let me turn over to this guy who's a little closer now, and then I can I can deal with him, maybe cut an arm off so he's not going to slash me. Oh, look, now they're kind of close. I'm going to run through this corner, try to melee them out of the way, and then go, run over here to put me put a little more distance between me and them. And it's, yeah. And, it's, if, and if one gets its hands on you, you're not dead. You just take some damage and you can you can recoup, you can regroup, you can move around the room. It's it's such a good experience in that it's not down to this thing of do it right or you die and then you got to try it again. It's like no, it's an organic experience. If you do something wrong, you'll get hit, but in Dead Space there are very few one-hit kills. And uh you can survive a good fight in Dead Space. That's what's so fun about the fights in Dead Space is that they are full-on engaging experiences. There's nothing mechanical about them, I find. And it it makes it fun. Did anybody else was was anybody else creeped out in the first Dead Space by, like Isaac Clark's, like audible moans and grunts when he's getting attacked or stomping because of, of the sound coming out of his suit? It's like this weird airy rasp sound, like whenever he moans or grunts or yeah. or yells. Yeah, mm. it's just I don't know the w- the way that his voice was processed by coming out of the suit was just so so eerie to me <laughs> and it, al- it almost at times made Isaac like seem inhuman sometimes on so compare that to everything else that's going around you it was just it was kind of creepy I thought yeah uh, you could definitely argue by the end of the game how <laughs> how much left of Isaac is there humanity wise because he yeah. has seen some some messed up stuff by the end of that game well, it definitely, you know, not to go right into Dead Space 2, but it also makes oh, no. it makes the, the Dead Space 2 transition work so well, because you believe that a dude who's gone through that is pretty screwed up by the mm. end of that. And and I, I even like that in Dead Space 1, you know, they, they kind of reveal that he's already a bit crazy, and you're like, you know, that kind of explains how he didn't just flee from every situation, if he is already a little bit nuts, too. He's, uh, I mean, he's not he's not outright insane, but the poor, the poor gentleman is a little bit, you know, he's been disturbed. And, He's uh, cuckoo for cocoa puffs. Yeah, <laughs> he just wants to find his girl, even though he saw her kill herself. He's looking for her. By the way, spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> there will be a spoiler disclaimer uh, at the start of this thing, but um, I, I want to leave everything open for us to talk about. Um, just to go in a little specific thing, like I want to start pulling up just moments now uh, that I can think of in Dead Space One, and and if either of you guys have any topics that you want to bring up, you know, feel free to. Um, but I just want to bring up briefly the the one the one encounter anyone who plays Dead Space One will have stories about, which is the regenerator. Um, oh man! The, the basically the bastard of the game. Um, the the most frustrating part of like fight in the game, aside from well, there's one part of the game I didn't like that I'll get to. But of all the enemies in the game, this is a guy who he's frustrating, but not in a bad way. He's frustrating by design. He's frustrating in a way that makes you get into it, and. He is such a good series of encounters, I think, is the Regenerator, um, which is uh, the, the the slightly less friendly doctor's um, experiment into a necromorph who can regenerate its own tissue. Um, and and these encounters are like the first time you fight it, I thought that was it. Where literally it's just like you got to you got to blow all its limbs off so it's regenerating, freeze it, and then put it. Make sure you do that in the cryo tube. Push the button, you've frozen it. Fight's over. What's great is when the guy just the that that was already a cool little fight, but it's when the guy reveals to you that he's let it out again. That's when I I was literally like, "Are you so you're telling me the regenerator could pop up at any moment, and I'm not in a cryostasis room with a huge freezing chamber?" And from that point on, until I saw him, I was unbelievably tense because I was like, the prospect of the regenerator popping up filled me with dread. And then the the whole scene where literally he is chasing you back through the ship while a bunch of other necromorphs are coming at. That was some of the most intense parts of Dead Space One to me. Oh, not not just that, like the part when he when he appears the second time because there's that whole room where there's the the uh, bunks. Mm-hmm. And they're they're all on the sliding. Oh God, Dan! Oh. Yeah. Oh, so you you have to slide these things out, almost like you're deconstructing a Tetris puzzle. Um, so you, you navigate your way through this, but as of course, as you're opening up areas, you're also closing them off behind you. You get to the end of this, and that son of a bitch falls right in front of your face. <laughs> Yeah. And you can't. You just you you go to run, and you realize that this block puzzle that you just did, you have to undo that yeah. while you're running from this bastard. Yeah, and I, I I think I almost crapped myself when when I hit that part. I, I paused the game, and I was like, I was I, I was honestly going, maybe I should just take a break for the night and start a session doing this. Then I was like, no, I'm just gonna do it. But yeah, 
you, you go through this thing and you have to, using your telekinesis, one at a time, move these bunks in a sliding puzzle. Oh. And when you're doing it, nobody, like this, these games, you never think about what you're doing. You're just like, I just got to get to the solution, right? So I'm sure I'm not the only one who was like, all right, I've, I, all I'm doing is I'm trying to clear a path through. I'm not going to remember what I move where, because who cares? I get back to that, and I'm being chased by him, and I'm realizing I have to I have to reopen the sliding puzzle in reverse to both block him getting to me and find my own way back through there. And I'm like, you you bastards! You actually I have to remember what I did in a sliding puzzle in a game. Yeah, and, the, the, and it takes a while to move those things as they well. Move, it's, yeah, it's they not move slow. A quick process. They move slow. They move one at a time. And and I mean, it is possible to to block him getting to you once you're about halfway through, but. Especially that opening part of the sliding puzzle, there is nothing you can do about him except to slow him, d- to turn around and constantly slow him down while you're trying to figure out. And you have to think while you're doing this. So it's so good because, as I said, you have all the tools at your disposal to do all, every, any action you want to do, you can do very easily. But you, it's, it's, it's putting all the work into your mind. You have to be calm and aware of everything going on. And you are certainly not going to be calm when this is going on. So you just have to be very aware of what's going on. <laughs> Yeah, the the best part about this was for me because uh, you know me and Andy here were were talking about this as I was going through it because he had already played the first one. So he was always asking me like, "So how far are you? What happened?" When I beat the regenerator the first time and froze him and put him out into space or whatever, um, the first thing Andy said to me is like, "Yeah, he's like, well, at least you don't have to worry about that guy anymore." He's like, "Oh, I hated that guy, <laughs> but yeah, I was I was so I was so ha- he's Andy's like, yeah, I, I was so happy like when you get rid of him because he's he's gone. I'm like, oh, thank God, I hate that." When that guy dropped down in front of me, I think I shouted, Andy, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I may have bent the truth slightly. Yeah, it's only slightly, but it, so it, I think the, the, the effect of that guy plopping down in front of me was even more than it was for the most part, because <laughs> my friend here, uh, that's how I learned that Andy is, is a, is a good liar when he wants to be, because it, it wasn't <laughs> over the top. It was just very subtle. It was, it was almost like, he was just thinking out loud. He's like, oh, yeah, I hate that guy. I'm so glad that you only have to fight him once. And I'm like, oh, good. And and and, <laughs> the, the, and to expand on that block puzzle thing, so you get through the block puzzle, then you're stuck in the room with the locked door. Um, oh, man. What's her name? Um, uh, Kendra is telling you to, to survive and hold on while she unlocks the door. I think that sequence went on for like three minutes while you're running mm-hmm. from this dude around this room and trying to dismember him enough to where you're slowing him down. Finally, she opens the door. You get into the elevator. Then Mercer, the the doctor that created him, who is this, you know, he's trying to br- bring about the second coming or whatever with these creatures he starts talking to you on the radio right mid conversation that bastard drops through the ceiling again so the game makes you think that oh yeah well this this audio dialogue opened up so you know you're safe because they're talking to you you're not safe because while he's talking to you this dude drops in and he's yeah oh, it was, that part was it, it 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 kept breaking what you think are the safe rules like when this exactly. happens uh, from the from from the diners or designer's standpoint the that means that you're okay because they obviously they don't want you running and fighting while they're they worked on this audio so when the audio plays they obviously want you to listen to it no they're using that as another psych out because here he comes again and and what really worked about him too is like now necromorphs in this game they move pretty fast but also a lot of them run at you in a full sprint The regenerator doesn't move as fast as they do, but he moves deceptively fast because Mm. he's not, he's not walking towards you as slow as like the nemesis in Resident Evil, for instance, he's power walking towards you and he does not, he never stops walking towards you. So I found that was another thing that really, for the first couple times I fought him, that really wigged me out when he was coming after me in corridors because I was like, oh, there's nothing to worry about. He's not moving as fast as these other necromorphs. And then, I, and then all of a sudden he'd be on me, and, I, and then I watched him, and I was like, "No, he's actually he's marching at me, pretty, pretty at a pretty steady pace." And um, when you get to parts like in uh, the part in the medical bay, when, or sorry, in, in the in the medical room, the hospital, when there's, I recall there's a couple of pregnants and the regenerator, and uh, I don't remember the details now. There's a reason why you can't get, you have to do something very specific to get the door open. And um, so I, you're spending a lot of time running in circles around the med bay, being chased by pregnants and the regenerator. 
and the way that he just he never stops coming i'd sometimes just go and like dude just can you slow down for one second so i can grab this piece of ammo can you just stop for one second so i can push this button because you have to hit some switches or something like that if i recall correctly and you can't just stop to hit the switch you have to hit the switch and keep moving because he'll he won't catch you as long as you're moving but you'll never leave the room if you keep moving and it's it's so well done i think just the, the regenerator was was one of the high points of the first game for me and then when you when you get to that shuttle bay i remember when i when i when i think i was gog did i talk to you after i got him i can't remember but we sh- i think we shared the experience or at least with somebody i shared the experience of when you finally when you when you roast that son of a bitch yeah I, we we <laughs> talked about it yeah yeah it it, it, it yeah, that part it took me a minute. It did take me a long time. I figured it out very fairly quickly. But when you're running from that guy, time slows down. Yeah, and so I okay. okay and the, here's the thing that they, that hit me because I don't I don't remember if he if the guy tells you because the whole the whole point is is you finally get away from the regenerator for the second time, but he's still out there. Um, and you're you're trying to fire up this shuttle as your guys' escape. Um, so you meet up with one of the few survival survivors left on the Ishimura, Dr. Kine, um, and he tells you to go to the shuttle. He le- finally lets you in after you do some stuff for him, and he's like, all right, wait there. I'll be there in a minute. And that's the last thing I heard from him. So I don't remember if he tells you to test the shuttle or test fire the engines or anything. All I remembered from him was, wait there, I'm on my way. So I wait. And I wait, and I wait, nothing happens. I'm looking around the room, I find some ammo, still waiting. See this door, see this big, shiny monitor that says, test fire the engine. And I'm like, I kind of don't want to test fire it, because I'm behind, like, thermal protected glass. And if this guy's going to meet me, and I hit the button, and he walks in the door, maybe it's going to kill him or something. Like, (laughs) maybe I shouldn't. And I waited, waited, and I was like, okay... You know, it, it's kind of obvious to me at this point that the game is waiting on me for to do something. So I'll go ahead and test fire the engines. I test fire the engines, and here comes the damn stampede after me. Um, and so I'm running. I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. Um, I'm be- I, somehow I, I end up behind the ship with the regenerator, and it just clicks. I'm like, yeah. wait a minute, I can hit that button again, can't I? <laughs> But I, I totally didn't. It didn't hit me for a second that, that that button could be hit multiple times. I just figured the sound of the engines did that, and it. But yeah, it was that was that was a, a really glorious moment, and just seeing that dude just deconstructed into fumes from the engines, and was, and still trying to get back up and walk towards you as it's happening. Yeah, and I, oh, and, and for the yeah. first moment, I was like, I was like, was I supposed to get him in the center behind the engine? Like, is he going to walk towards me completely on fire now? <laughs> <laughs> um andy how, how about how did you deal with the the regenerator and the the shuttle sequence like how did how did that go for you <laughs> uh it it went a lot worse than it did for god because I, I assumed that you did it once and then you were like oh okay uh, and then when the regenerator appeared i was just like there's nothing to kill him with yeah <laughs> what what do i do <laughs> and like obviously i was trying to use my my indicator my ground navigation system to try and point me in the right direction and it would just, it would just point uh, like back to the control room and i was like what's that going to do there's nothing in there and then eventually like i can't remember what it was exactly but something eventually clicked and went oh my god why didn't i, I think i put it on pause i got myself a drink i sat down and had a biscuit and just kind of th- thought for a bit and then it clicked <laughs> uh, I, I cut off that guy's legs, froze him in place, and set him on fire. And like you said, when you do it, the satisfaction is so great because this guy's been on your ass for so so much of the game. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Like you think I will you... say, you're good. Uh, that w- one of the good things, uh, not just about him returning for the second time, but another good thing that that does is if you didn't hate that doctor at the first time you met him, you really hated him when he when he told you that he got the regenerator back. Mm-hmm. You were like, "Why would you do that? I just killed him." Yeah, like a lot of these human characters, like even Mercer, there's a degree where you're like, "Are they just being driven insane by the marker? Like, is there a way that we can we can sort this out?" When he says, "By the way, I re-released the regenerator," you're just like, "You know what? If I ever see you." I'm gonna put a, a friggin. I'm gonna cut your arms off with my little my little plasma cutter here, and I'm gonna throw yeah. you into space with a, with a with a space suit on. I'm gonna cut your limbs off, put you in a space suit, and throw you out into space, and let you bleed out in space. Seriously, 
You bastard. Then, <laughs> the game takes that joy away from you. <laughs> that was one of the that was the part where the game is like the, like literally the game was just like we're not going to let you feel we gave you the regenerator, but you're you, we're not going to give you the satisfaction on on Mercer. Although you, you technically can get the satisfaction, but it's not the same. Cuz he You got to hurry. He's he's partially dead at the time. He got what he wanted, and that's that's the the worst part. <laughs> it's like yeah. Mercer kind of got a happy ending <laughs> in his own twisted little world. Um, yeah, I I I didn't really understand Mercer's mo- motivation, but I suppose that's trying to understand a an insane person's desire. You're, so. you're trying to buy into, like, you, to understand his motivation is like he was a unitologist. He thought necromorphs were like, y- if you look at unitology as being like, you know, the the dudes who all drank a bunch of poison Kool Aid to go up to a spaceship, becoming a <laughs> necromorph was going up to the spaceship. Yeah. Um. My own little story about the regenerator is like it kind of clicked with me what to do right away, but this is what happened with me. Um, I was so focused and fixated on killing that friggin' guy that I ignored the twitchers that came into the, the shuttle bay as well. Because I thought, you know, whatever, I'm going to kill the regenerator, that'll reset the sequence. Because that's usually what happens in games, is you kill the boss, all the the reg- all the, the hordes of minions will just kind of, they'll despawn, because they they were unlimited anyway. So I go into the control room, door closes behind me in the control room, and uh, so I thought, like, okay, I'm sealed in here. I, I watched the regenerator burn, right? And I'm just standing there watching him burning, going like, I got you. As I'm standing there watching him burning, the two Twitchers I'd left outside, they I thought they were going to get torched as well. And I realized that I saw them go into a floor grating when I went into the control room, and I didn't think about it. As I'm watching the regenerator burn, both Twitchers burst in through the ceiling of the control room. And so I'm watching my glorious moment finishes just as it finishes a pair of twitchers jump on me and I'm like, ah, and so I like turned around and blew half my ammo, just like in utter panic, uh, killing them. So I like, I, I, I was not thinking at all. I was just like, I, I went into that mindset of like, I'm going to take my plasma cutter and I will put plasma bolts and lines into you until you stop moving. And I went through like 30 shots, I think on those two, twi- two twitchers, but, um, that was my story, which again shows that this game will break the rules. Uh, quite happily, in that you're watching a scripted sequence of this regenerator finally burning. As you're watching it, if you didn't kill everybody, they will come through the ceiling to come and say hello to you. <laughs> and that that was, I think, actually possibly my biggest freakout in the game was when those twitchers burst in during the cutscene. I was like, you don't burst in during a cutscene! You're supposed to be out yeah. there, despawning! <laughs> and twi- the thing is with twitchers, too, is they're the worst types of necromorphs to surprise you because they move... Uh so unnaturally Mm -hmm. so it's not like you you turn around and you see a creature walking towards you or even running towards you you just see these things just twitching their ass off moving towards you in ways that can't be described it's it's horrible they they are like everything frightening about um like in j-horror when you have like a like a girl coming out of a tv screen or something uh they, they are like that they're like walking glitches that are in the game. The, the story behind them is, if, if you haven't, if you're listening to this for some reason, you haven't actually played through these games, I, I don't know why you'd be doing that, but uh, the Twitchers are uh, soldiers who had personal stasis systems on them, uh, like kind of like the stasis thing that, that you use in the game, and they had those built into their, their biologies, and then they got taken over by necromorphs, and so their stasis system has basically gone nuts, and they're now moving at, like, hyperspeed. And uh, the, the thing about Twitchers that's really freaky is that they, in my experience, they don't just run up and hit you like most necromorphs. They, as I said before, they stand in front of you for a few seconds, just twitching at you. And they do so in a way where, if you haven't seen them very much, you kind of stare back at them. You're like, what are you doing? <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's that's my experience with that friggin' regenerator. Um, what's, what's another thing? In the, uh, Gog, is there anything else in Dead Space 1 you'd like to bring up? I will say maybe story-wise that something that I I guess I never really understood. And I think maybe some of the ancillary fiction attempted to describe it, but it just seems, well, okay. Well, I guess, maybe we should just talk about uh, the hive mind. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't really know, <laughs> know what to say about it that much. Uh, it, it It's implied that, in the in the uh, fr- in the first game that he was able to control all of the uh the necromorphs um but there seemed to be a little uh like two different forces at work there yeah because the hive mind 
if it was indeed controlling the necromorphs, then the hive mind was trying to kill you. But the the marker, which okay, well, okay, I, I get when uh, we're assuming everyone who is listening to this has probably played the game or doesn't care about spoilers. But um, you you see in the in the, earlier in the game, uh, Nicole Brennan. Isaac's girlfriend, who he had been searching for, alive and well. Turns out she's not so alive, and the Nicole that you've been seeing is basically just, I guess, an avatar for the marker. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And sh- that seems to almost be working in opposition to the hive mind who is trying to massacre you. So, mm-hmm. I guess... Does anybody have any thoughts on that? Because I, I guess I, I, I don't know if the game itself made it clear. Like I said, maybe some of the fiction did, but... Um, well, I, I did I, some reading on, on that, because I was, I was a little bit confused myself. Um, <clears throat> as I understand it, uh, it's very likely that the marker in Dead Space 1 was, to some degree, trying to... Uh, not, I don't even know if it was trying to help you so much as it just wanted you to finish what it, what its purpose was, which was to to occupy that pedestal on that planet and and keep the necromorph organism dormant where it lay. And with the marker gone, the necromorph organism would go out of control. So uh, there there have been a lot of posts I read on message boards and whatnot. There's actually a huge Dead Space thread on uh, on Penny Arcade that had some really good discussion on this. I thought uh, buried within it. And it's it's kind of like the the marker in Dead Space One was kind of a semi uh, protagonist in that it just wanted to be put back into its dormant state almost. It wanted to be left on its pedestal where it would emanate its its whatever it emanates energy stuff and leave the necromorphs um, dormant. And then when it was removed from that pedestal for whatever reason, it would go out of, out of control and the necromorph organism would wake up and start infecting everything. So. A lot of people said, why did the markers seem to have, why, why did the markers in both Dead Space games seem to have different motivations? And it's also mentioned by some folks who hypothesize this, that because these markers were man-made copies, they were very likely flawed in some way. And that's why you get these these different motivations in the markers. That's why in Dead Space 1, the marker is at the end of the day actually wanting to just keep necromorphs dormant and like alive but dormant on that planet where they wouldn't harm anything and would stay in one place. Uh, whereas in, in Dead Space 2, as we'll probably get to, the, that marker was a little bit more antagonistic and wanted to co- bring about a convergence where it would probably create another hive mind. So I think in Dead Space 1, the marker was kind of on your side, but the very nature of how it the marker operates would also cause everyone to just start going nuts. I, I remember, I don't know if this was in a piece of ancillary fiction, if it was in Dead Space 2, or if it was in Extraction where I saw this, but there was something about how the the energy that the marker emanates that causes people some people to go nuts ha- has entirely to do with people's IQ levels so that if your IQ level was under a certain mark you'd go crazy and try to kill everybody and if it was over a certain mark you'd be completely unaffected and um perhaps even able to or you'd be in Isaac's position, position and have the marker imprinted in you so you'd be able to create them yourself so it's it's kind of like the the confusion comes from the whole thing of an argument I read, which is that the original marker probably had some intent that they've never stated, but these other markers have weird, almost self-contradictory intents, possibly because they're copies of the original. So, like, their biological AI is also flawed and becomes a, a weird individual thing that is, in many yeah. cases, completely nuts as well. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and certainly, though, it, I mean, it's... It it it's it seems a very safe bet to assume that the markers are somewhat sentient because yes, yes. if if and that that might sound like a bit, a bit of a stretch but if the if the marker is able to control an avatar of someone familiar to you and speak to you in your own language and subtly guide you towards things I mean I guess you could make the claim that maybe it's just stimulating your brain and your brain is coming up with that but. Mm. It certainly is safe to assume that the marker has an intelligence and a motivation. Um, so if each marker is sentient, it's very possible that each marker has its own personal motivation. That's entirely um, what I've bought into. Yeah, um, and, and, and I mean, that's, that does seem like a stretch. I, I, I'm i all for certain things being mysterious, but that I, that is really one thing that, that kind of sticks out for me, and I, I really want... 
the next chapter in Dead Space to to cover why the markers themselves seem to contradict some of the other forces at work when they all seem to be basically part of the same machine. Yeah, like they they all serve the same function, but they they also all seem to have different motivations despite their inbuilt functions. And I, and I as I said, I entirely buy into the idea that the fact that they that you know what they mentioned there's more than one marker, there's more than two markers out there. Uh, and that they're all like man-made copies. The man-made copy part is what makes me think that you know there are obviously going to be flaws in those copies. And and since nobody knows how those biological artificial intelligences even work, um, it's very likely that that's what's causing these different markers to be you know deranged in their own ways. That's why I agree. In Dead Space, if they do a Dead Space three, it doesn't have to be about Isaac Clarke anymore. His story is kind of done. Um, to, you know, it's it's been done enough to a point where I'd be happy if this that's the last we saw of him. But I think in Dead Space 3, it would be a way more to their benefit to say Dead Space 3 is going to be about the markers. And if we're going to see a third marker, if the, if the third, this would be the time. Have a third marker, make it, again, a, a, have different motivations, and use that as the keystone to show why these different markers seem to have different personalities built into them, or, or coming out of them, as it were. Um, Andy, how, how did you feel about the 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 markers motivations or the, the fiction behind it. Like, did you find it confusing at all or I, I did, but as, as you've both been talking, I've been formulating my, my own idea. Cause but the markers did uh, show uh, or share something in common, which was make us whole again. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was both of like the avatar of Nicole each time said that to Isaac make us whole again. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've got no real basis to base this off, but perhaps the, the marker, uh, interacts more with the hive mind than we think, then perhaps it just making it lie dormant. What if, I, like I say, no basis for fact, uh, mm. but it, on the statement of makers whole again, that the that the actual marker is the the mind of the hive mind, and the the hive mind is more so the body. Mm. So when you take that away, the hive mind went out of control, and the first marker's purpose was to be reconnected with the hive mind to be made whole again, if you would. And yeah. the hive mind was against you because it was out of control. And in the second game, it's wanting to create another hive mind to have its body or something potentially that could control the rest of the, the necromorphs. Like I say, no mm-hmm. sense for, for basis, but uh, who knows? I think that's a good. That's the only logic I can come up with. I think that's a good theory because that makes it kind of like in Dead Space One, you're interacting with a mind that wants to get back to its body, and the body in the meantime is just thrashing about and going on its biological imperative of just make more necromorph tissue. Um, Whereas in the second game, you've created a mind that has no body, so that mind is like, make me a body because I I want a body now. Again, and that's the thing about Dead Space is that it has all this really good potential. And as we said about the ancillary fiction, not you know entirely being all that awesome, um, it's got really good story potential that unfortunately is kind of just left up to this kind of speculation for now uh, until the folks behind the game's storyline either just come out and drop story bible quotes on us or decide to tackle it in a more entertaining way and 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 close up that story a little bit should they finish off their their trilogy. Um thinking about anything else in Dead Space 1 that I that I really recall. I, I actually, uh, I, I spent a lot of Dead Space 1 because I did not get spoiled on it at all. Um, I, I spent a while in Dead Space 1 trying to figure out, like, what the Nicole visions were. Because, uh, you know, especially in hindsight, when you think about what did they represent. Because Dead Space 2 does a good job of, sh- of kind of showing you what's actually happening. Especially that one time when you, you see that there's a vision of, of Nicole and she's going to stick something in your eye. And then if you get by that part, you realize that it's Isaac who was about to stick something in his own eye. So I'm always curious, like, you know, the part in Dead Space 1 where you're defending her from the control station, was oh, Isaac yeah. was Isaac actually over there himself? Yeah, um, I, I wanted to actually talk about that bit, because if she dies, it says Nicole had died. <laughs> when you look back at that game now, you, you just think of, like, uh, Colonel Campbell screaming at Time Paradox Snake. Yeah. Because... <laughs> So something again that I thought of is perhaps the marker through the image of Nicole over another survivor, and it's somebody else you're protecting. Because that's because there's no way a a hallucination could do all that. It would need to be someone 
And I like the idea of, uh, like you say, it's actually Isaac over there uh, doing it. But I, I imagine it, when I was playing it, I thought it was probably just another person who had survived who fixed the console and was asking you to defend them, and you defended them, and then they ran off and got killed somewhere. Yeah, and they asked, they asked you to defend them, and the whole time you were just mute and staring at them in a really creepy way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, that scene especially, um, compared to what you see in Extraction, because, you know, we, I'm sure, we'll, I guess we'll cover Extraction later, but the first chapter in Extraction, you play as someone who is literally going insane from the effects of the marker and you learn that the stuff that some of these people are seeing is is not what they're actually seeing and they, these people think that they are they're running from creatures and monsters and it you, it turns out they're just people and you're slaughtering people mm. and it the game really makes you wonder at times is some of the stuff that you you are seeing through Isaac's eyes even really happening. I mean, absolutely. Hey, there's 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 no guarantee that Isaac hasn't seen survivors run up to him and he has just cut them into pieces because he thought they were another necromorph. That could yeah. that could have happened several times. <laughs> Absolutely, it, um, yeah. And even when you when you see survivors who um you know like especially, like even the guy who tr- asks for help and then gets killed by the lurker, um. And especially in the second game, when some of the hallucinations you see in, in Dead Space 2, it has this really nice layer of ambiguity where you're kind of like, I wonder, you know, like, what have I been doing this whole time? Um, and that, that actually, there, there's, a, there's a really cool example of that in Silent Hill. Uh, this is only slightly related, but there's one part in Silent Hill where it's implied in one game that all the monsters you see in Silent Hill are actually just people who are lost in Silent Hill as well. And you happen to be seeing them as monsters. Um and you know, beating them and bludgeoning them with pipes and whatnot. Um, but no, it's, it's definitely and, and and extraction definitely offers a really cool perspective on that. Um, do, do we have anything else about Dead Space One we want to bring up, or should we move? I was thinking we could move um, into extraction because it was kind of there, the next in line. There is one thing that that I do want to bring up, and that's the the whole twist with Kendra. Mm. I I did not see it coming. No, um, I didn't either. <laughs> again, miss the game totally pulls a magician's misdirection. Sleight of hand, getting your attention away from the hand that's doing the trick and not telling you to watch it, but performing in a way that forces you to to, to look at the other one. Um, all the subtle little, did Hammond do it? Didn't he? Is he, mm-hmm. does, you know, all the little hints that Hammond has his own motivations. Um, he's, he's working for someone else. Uh, Nicole, or not Nicole, Kendra. Looking into him, losing track, trying to find him, trying to find out what he's doing. The whole the whole time, the game is subtly hinting that there may be something going on with Hammond. You, as a player, are thinking, okay, well, he's probably, you know, okay, yeah, they totally want me to think Hammond did it. The big reveal is, Hammond's your friend, he's going to save you. No, it's not. <laughs> The reveal is that the whole time the person that you think is your friend is is doing this whole magician sleight of hand thing, and she's a freaking secret agent the whole time. And yeah, and, and she's, she's just she's, saying just saying that aloud sounds kind of like okay, well, you know that that's been done before, yeah, but twist. it's all the, <laughs> the the subtle little tricks that it does because the game doesn't just tr- tell you Hammond might be bad. It's done very subtly. It's hinted at. It's never spelled out. You, your brain, the way you, most people process fiction in the modern age, start to veer in that direction. There may be, may be something going on with Hammond. The game isn't necessarily telling me that it is, but you start to wonder. But it's all done very subtly to keep your attention off the person who t- turns out to completely stab you in the back. And, and, and she's really nasty about it, too, because she oh, basically yeah. almost says, like, by the way, you're completely insane, but I've been using you because you're pretty effective at this, and you're crazy, so I don't feel too bad about leaving you behind. Mm. Like, she's she's kind of a dick <laughs> by, oh, by yeah. the end of that. She um, gets her come up and so in the end. My, but, my brother, the hive mind, just gives her gives her the double backhand, <laughs> and throws her into a wall, and she explodes. <laughs> the, like Gog was saying, it it was really cool how subtle they were pulling it off. Because when it's subtle, it's like it's not what he does, but it's the fact that he goes out of communication for long, long periods of time. Like when you fix mm-hmm. the 
uh, air filtration system. And he was, uh, when you first met him on that level, he was like gasping for air and he's like, I'll, I'll, don't worry, I'll be here. And then like, when you fix it, he's gone. You can't contact him. How mm. much of that is Kendra like blocking off communications? Oh, in hindsight, yeah, you're like, yeah, you're like, what? what you know, when she said, "Oh, he's out of communication," when you're when you're relying on her to keep you in touch with everybody, because she was in the computer room, wasn't she? Uh, yeah, the she whole was holding up there for the entire game. Yeah, yeah. What was she doing up there? Um, <laughs> and also, I kind of like that Hammond. He, he, you know, he didn't necessarily go out like a badass, but he did go out as tough as you can go out. The way that he went out. I think he pre- I think he went out as a badass. I mean, he went out by one of the hardest creatures in yeah, Dead Space, by the Regenerator. A, a dark, a dark brute just kind of walked up behind him, and Hammond just went like, "Oh, well, I'm dead, but I'm gonna shoot you!" And then, yeah, he that gets was really sad because that's when you learn he was on your side. I was like, "No, Hammond!" Yeah, and then he gets his leg pulled off. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, oh god, Hammond. And uh, I, I did, I did pick up his body and throw it down a vent um, in that honor of him. That was nice of you. So I I made sure that he could not be necromorphized and just yeah. stood on him until <laughs> yeah. his body parts Spe- were off. Speaking of not being necromorphized, before we move on, one one of the one of my favorite moments from the game, and I know I've talked to Andy about this, is you find an audio log of someone who <laughs> is he has survived, he's tried everything he can do to escape, uh. And he realizes oh, yeah. that it's over. He's he's not going to make it. He's done. The ship is is lost. There's no way he's ever going to be, uh, and anything other than a, a necromorph. After all is said and done, so he decides he's going to die on his own terms and records his final audio log. Um, and the recording keeps going as he decides that he's not going to be one of them, no matter what. And he dismembers himself <laughs> yeah. one limb at a time. Until uh, until I figure the final bl- the final blow has to be his own head, uh, and you hear him uh, sh- using his plasma cutter to take off uh, all of his limbs, and then he shoots himself. Um, that guy went out like a champ. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I remember that audio log now. That that guy was. A- yeah, he said, "I'm not going to be one of them," and uh, yeah, so that was it, chilling. It, that was one yeah, of the it, most chilling yeah. audio logs. And, and and then also that audio log made you think, and I mean, Dead Space 2 literally brings it up, but Nicole just injected herself with something to go out. And I love the implication that she might have been out there somewhere, perhaps yeah. as one of the necromorphs that attacked you. Um, <clears throat> Gog, that reminded me, wasn't it Dead Space 1 that had a moment you told me about, which I hit as well, which is a room with an infector in it that you might not entirely realize is in there right away? Oh, yeah. I don't know if this was scripted or if it was just a horrible horrible oversight on my part but there's a part where it's the room where i think it's toward the end of the game maybe like chapter mm. nine or ten um it's a two th- it's it a might- two-floor room i remember because because yeah something like this happened to me where <laughs> i knew there was an infector but i was like oh it's just one infector i'll take my time and then by the time i got down there i shouldn't have oh, taken my time yeah what, what happened with me it's the room where you see all the candles it, lo- it looks like a bunch of unitologists holding the little love in oh. or something whatever they call it mm-hmm. but I had been in this room several times. Uh, I think the first time I went down there, there may have been a couple of necromorphs, nothing big. I had gone in and out of this room. It's kind of like a hub. Um, had completed some tasks. I was in bad shape. Uh, so the first thing I do is I'm running to uh, to the store because I need to buy some stuff because I don't have a lot of ammunition left. Um, before I went in the store, I looked around, made sure, didn't see anything, waited for a minute. You listen for sounds. That's one thing you always do in dead space is you listen. Uh, didn't hear anything. Go into the store. While I'm in the store, I hear an infester behind me, and I'm like, back out, back out. I'm just hitting, because I played on the PC, I'm just like hitting the back button. I'm like, come on, come on, Isaac, come on. Like, as I'm backing out of the store, like, it kind of zooms out, and I'm, blah, blah, I'm getting damaged. Uh, I was like, oh, gosh. I mean, it's, it's, that's one thing that Dead Space did so well, is there's no HUD, Everything is in real time. So when you're mm-hmm. pulling up your map, you're pulling up your inventory, you're pulling up all this stuff, it's the game still continues to to happen in real time around you. And you I learned the hard way that that also includes the store because just just because the the, the the it zooms away from Isaac and goes into the screen where you're selecting and buying stuff, yeah, <laughs> the the necromorphs are still out there. Um yep. and that that really creeped the hell out of me because it took mm-hmm a minute to back out of that, of the whole 
logging into the store part and I'm just like hitting that button like come on come on um and then by, I think in the time that I had uh in the time that I had gone into the store and back back out the in, the infester had already infected like t- two dead bodies yeah that that room I saw the infector and I was like oh it's just down. I'll just take my time I'm just going to quickly grab something from the store and I'll head back down there I the store gave me no I never got attacked in the store so your story is the one that let me know that that could happen but I went back down. I hit. I hit. I hit the elevator. I was like, "I'll just head down this elevator." Head down. As the elevator's de- de- descending, I realized that now there's an infector and like five necromorphs down there. And I'm like, "There was only one." And I was like, "I thought I dismembered all these bodies." And I, apparently, there was a stack of bodies in a corner I'd missed, or something like that. And it didn't go well. Um, I didn't want to, that. There's a couple things now that I'm remembering. I wanted to bring up. But one thing is like, I love how the user interface in that game is all like it's just projected off of Isaac's armor, basically, and you can you can even turn the camera around to look at the the back of the UI, which is kind of cool. But uh, it's Isaac's uh, health indicator that I really like on his back because this is something actually I meant to bring up earlier. Um, when you get into those scripted little animations when a, a necromorph jumps on you, one of the genius things it does is that the camera changes so you can't entirely see Isaac's health indicator clearly. So there are times where just to add a little bit of tension, I think, like if Isaac gets knocked over by a brute or something or is in one of those scripted sequences, there will be moments, especially when you when you start going into the animation to get out of those sequences and get back into your regular standing animation where you don't see his health indicator because it's behind him and the camera's facing the wrong way or he's on his back. And you're kind of like, I got to am I in the red? Am I in the yellow? What's going on here? And uh, I thought that was actually kind of neat, too, for tension because it made it a little bit more difficult to keep track of how damaged you were. Um, yeah, that, that happened to me on the first brute fight because uh, when I first came across the brute, I I wasn't sure exactly how to fight it, um, and I was you're in a very enclosed space, so yeah, he knocked me down a couple times. I'm like, get up! <laughs> I don't know how much life I have. Do I have to hit the quick heal button? What what? So yeah, I felt that as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the one other thing about Dead Space, this is my one negative thing in Dead Space I want to bring up, and it's pretty common for this to be negative. For me, it was it was a drag. Um, is when you have to shoot at asteroids. <sighs> I, I and and if there's one thing that shows that these guys knew what they were doing, guess what? You never do in Dead Space Two, and it, for any prolonged amount of time, is shoot at stupid asteroids. This is one yeah. sequence in Dead Space One where you have to shoot at asteroids to prevent them from hitting the ship, and it is it it it. Uh, it's not like a poorly done sequence on its own, but it's both a little bit frustrating, a little bit difficult, and it obliterates the pace of the game at that point for that that moment when you're you're doing that. You have to man a turret basically and shoot at asteroids. There's another point where you man a turret and you fight a Leviathan slug thing that's attached to the outside of the ship. That's kind of cool. Um, but it's when you're shooting at asteroids, it's just, it was a drag and I did not like that part. And then when I went on Twitter to whine about it, everyone went like, yeah, nobody likes that part. And I was like, okay. Yeah, at least you weren't <laughs> aiming for an achievement. There's an achievement attached yeah, to Yeah, it's like, it's like do it and keep your percentage over like 60, 70, or 80%. I managed oh. to do it, but it was, <laughs> it's a pain. If I was aiming it's for that a, achievement. Was... I, th- I think I would have been punching something by the end of that <laughs> especially it's, keep it's it horrible keeping it over 80 like <laughs> I, d- I don't think it's that high but it's it's pretty high it's to an irritating point where you're like oh one tiny asteroid hit me yeah ah oh. no I, I did not like the asteroid part it was a bummer um i don't know just i guess to close up dead space one was there anything about the game either of you guys found a bummer i mean aside from the asteroid thing or do you have any stories about the asteroid part <laughs> I failed that part like three times as well because I did not entirely understand that I could, you know, conserve ammo by shooting just one turret and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, I, f- I figured that out um, later on. I think maybe about halfway through. I, I got I got lucky. I actually beat it on my first try. Oh, but I, wish. I I it was by the skin of my teeth. Yeah, um, three times I went through that thing. On the third time, then, I was like, if I don't get it this time, I'm closing up for the night. I'm going yeah. doing something else. <laughs> yeah, so. I was thankful I didn't have to do that again. Yeah, well, and Andy, you said you were going for an achievement on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that was not that was not fun. That was I think that was like a second playthrough thing where I was like, okay, I got to do this this time around, yeah. and it was a drag. I'm. Uh, I think I'll skip that that trophy if it's in. The <laughs> only other drag was impossible mode. Have you have you tried impossible mode? No, no, I haven't yet. I've I've heard that it's pretty rough. 
Yeah, it takes a lot of shots from even an upgraded plasma cutter to cut off one limb. And I was like, oh god, if it takes this much ammo to cut off one limb from one necromorph, how am I going to do when I start hitting the black ones? How am I going to do, more importantly, when I hit the regenerator? I was going to say, that's... <laughs> I was like, I, I, I may have like better armor, I may have better weapons, but I do not have the patience or the, uh, the, you know, the constitution to keep going like this. I yeah. had to stop it there. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to go back and try Dead Space One on a higher difficulty sometime, but um, I think also because, as far as I understand it, the new game plus in Dead Space One doesn't work quite as nicely in Number Two. Um, no, I'm not sure. It doesn't. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if I want to go through it. I'm I also I'm I am not a gamer who who really enjoys the play like even in, I, I still I'm gonna do it sometime, but I haven't even tried an insanity run on Mass Effect yet. Because I'm kind of like which one, one I, or two, either one. Um, oh, one one you have to really grind because you need to unlock uh, the the second hardest difficulty playthrough on that, and then play through on insanity. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I'm I'm this I, I I tend to be a little bit of a like my my primary experience with most games is my first play through the single player mode and then usually mm. anything else I do is more so either out of a love of the game or out of some multiplayer stuff involved in it but um I I am still I really would like to play through Dead Space two again because also it's it's new game plus feature works a bit nicer and I can always I can vary my the nice thing about Dead Space I mean no, in number one this is kind of a factor but all the different weapons you have available one fun thing I found about Dead Space is that you'll always encounter somebody out there who played through the game using an entirely different set of weapons than you did and that that to me also adds to the replay value yeah. because you can you can play through the game just using the plasma cutter pretty much and maybe the line gun and then you can go through again using like the ripper and the and the the kinetic push thing. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that was that was really my experience because after when I had played Dead Space, of course, I was I was on Twitter talking about it, and the game had already been out for several years, so or a couple, however long it had been out. Um, but uh, yeah, everyone was like, "Oh man, you got to do this weapon!" Like some people would swear by the assault rifle, yeah. some people would swear by the Ripper, and they'd say the assault rifle is garbage. No, you got to use the Ripper. Then other people were like, "Oh no, you gotta you gotta stick with the force gun." I hate the Ripper. Don't go near it. Um, yeah, ev everyone has a very, are very passionate about the weapons they like in Dead Space and are passionate about the ones that they don't like. Yeah. Um, the one thing everybody agrees on is the plasma cutter and the line gun are awesome. Um, mm. after that, it's anyone's guess, but yeah, it's every, yeah, there, and there's, I found that uh, like the Ripper, I didn't touch the Ripper, um, in Dead Space 1, um, in Dead Space Extraction, they make you use it for a level. And I was like, this weapon's awesome! <laughs> so, um, I, when I had played uh, Dead Space 2, I I went in and I got the Ripper. And I'm like, I love this thing! And it was it was just crazy, because I had avoided it in the first one, and then the second one, I totally loved it. But uh, like, all the weapons have their... have very unique, diverse methods for... Uh, their function and some people there's there's something out there for everyone to like and chances are you and your friend might might have two very different opinions about which are your favorite weapons in that game but well, they they're, they're, they can all be effective in their own way they're even built pretty much for different like if you don't like a certain play style like i mean the the line gun and the plasma cutter are built for you know take your shots aim at limbs and blow limbs off um but if you don't like that like like i i, I do not comprehend how someone would would prefer the the you know basically the machine gun the pulse rifle thing but i i understand how it's useful in some situations but you know for people to swear by it it also means probably they upgraded it a whole lot and i think that's part of what makes the game so nicely replayable as well um like in dead space 2 my 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 upgrade scheme was i maxed out the plasma cutter and started to upgrade my my rig and my stasis in preparation for a new game plus where i'd have basically a good pistol, a good rig, and full stasis abilities to then start experimenting with other stuff. Because, like, I my my own experience was I like the Ripper when I have plenty of stasis, so I can mm. freeze things and run the saw blade all over them. So I was like, I'm going to set up so that in my next playthrough of Dead Space Two, I'll primarily use the Ripper because I'll have piles of stasis built up, uh, so I can I can totally just lock guys down and rip them, as it were. But uh, no, it's it's a very cool aspect of it, I think, and and again, a, a really good part of of making a game both replayable and just playable for a lot of different people. It's nice when a game has options that 
that don't like there's a lot of games with options but at the end of the day everyone just picks the same thing because it's like well there's options but if you don't use this certain combination the game is kind of boring or it sucks or it's not as fun um and and i think that's even something i think mass effect did really well although a lot of people will just say play the soldier because you get the most guns like i played i played vanguard and in mass effect 2 i was friggin rocking the like, you know, the biotic charge, then shotgun the guys because my charge puts them in slow motion for two seconds as they bounce off me. Um, so and that, to me, that's a mark of a good game when there's different ways to play it that are all just as viable to a degree. Um, but I guess it's this it was uh, Andy. Is there anything from Dead Space one you'd like to, to bring up? Mm, no, I, I think we've we've pretty much covered it all. It it had a great story. I, I liked how it ended. How you weren't on the ship for the entire game, which was a nice thing. I thought mm. you'd get off the ship and you'd you'd go home, but no, you you go down and you finish the mission off in a really awesome reveal as well. Like uh, me and Gog were were talking about this uh, last night. Uh, Isaac Clark may not have a lot of emotion to him in that first game, but when he finds out, when he's confronted with the fact that Nicole's dead, you can see the the avatar of uh, Isaac Clark really is is suffering from that loss and that realization. Mm. Even though no sound is given, it's it's still quite hard to watch because you're like, oh man, I'm playing as this guy, and he's found out once and for all his girlfriend is dead. Yeah, this this poor guy, like you, you. They get it. They do a really good job at just getting across how broken the guy is. Pretty yeah. Much like he's he's a busted dude, and you feel kind of bad for him. And it kind of empowers you to be like, you know what? I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna, you know, even though I'm technically playing as him, I'm gonna be a bro. I'm gonna give Isaac some closure here. Let's let's do this. Let's. <laughs> you're, and then I'm, you get to that end. That that last bit. That last shot of Dead Space. Oh. That made me jump. Friggin <laughs> I, like, I yeah, my bastards. my skin was was in the air before I was in the air. On that part, because I was not expecting that, and I was like, that was the one thing that I was still was thinking about. I was like, I wonder if there was a necromorph Nicole. Oh God! <laughs> it's the fact that it's so generic as well, because most horror films do that. They usually yeah. have a, oh, we're safe. Oh God! And it's it's the fact that you see Isaac Clarke's face for the first time, and you can see he's like, it's all over. <laughs> and then he turns around and he sees Nicole, and you go, oh God. And that's, I think that just, that's a, that's a beautiful thing about Dead Space 1 is for all the things we said where like, you know, Dead Space 1 does story twists, it does things that, that, you know, when you say them out loud, don't sound all that amazing. Dead Space 1 was really good at delivering stuff. And I think it proved that like, you can have something on paper that looks a little bit boring. If you deliver it well, it'll be awesome. Mm. It's, it's not just about having, you know, on paper, the coolest looking set of bullet points ever. You can have a boring set of bullet points and you can deliver them in a way that makes them exciting. I think Dead Space was was pretty good at that. Um, let's 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 also just, let's let's push along because we got we got other stuff to to cover here too. Let's let's go quickly into Dead Space Extraction, which is uh, it was the next game in the series, and it was uh, I played it. It it made me buy a move because it was packed in on my PS3 copy of Dead Space Two, and I didn't want to play it with a controller. I was like, I want to play this properly, so I went out and and used some gift certificates to get a move. And uh, I got to say, I I actually really like rail shooters, um, like. Ask me about Time Crisis 2, and I'll tell you how much I spent playing that in the arcade on the ferry uh, during my teenage years going to fencing tournaments. Um, and I think it's probably one of the best rail shooters I've played. Uh, it does a really good job as a rail shooter. It was an engaging story. It was, it was I think, some pretty fun gameplay. Maybe in it drug a little bit at some points, i.e. the sewer level went a little yes. bit longer than I would have liked. But... Um, it, it, it's it's really fun to play, at least with a move where you're holding the gun and you're you're switching weapons and you're shooting stuff. Um, I, I really enjoyed that game. Uh, I, I thought it was going to be a bit of a throwaway experience, and I hadn't heard that much about it, so I thought maybe it just it didn't click with a lot of people. But uh, I think it's great. It, it also you know it has a lot of good um, additions to the ca- the the canon of Dead Space, and it has some of my favorite Dead Space characters in it. Um, I think I have professed at length my love of uh, Weller um, outside of podcast recordings, but uh, I, I really dug Extraction. Um, Gog, uh, I believe you played it with a move as well. Yeah, I, um, I when I f- okay, I, I had I bought Dead Space two, um, stayed in the shrink wrap while I played Dead Space one, um, busted up, busted, busted open uh, Dead Space two, played it for a bit. Um, and then I'm trying to remember if that's exactly how it worked or not. I think I might have played 
Extraction. I don't remember. I, I played Extraction before I beat Dead Space 2. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure it, it, in which order exactly I finished them, but uh, it doesn't matter. The I, I was of kind of of a similar vein. I had popped in Extraction, played it originally with the, the sticks because I didn't have a move controller. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, this is not fun at all. <laughs> and, and I knew that it was just, that it wasn't designed because Extraction was originally a Wii game. Yeah. Um, at full price, 50 bucks. Um, then they put it on the, the PlayStation Store for, I think, 15 and then uh, just decided to pack it in as a freebie with Dead Space 2, uh, which is how I got it. Oh, but with the quote unquote limited edition. Yes. <laughs> and um, so I was, I always knew that it was a, a, a game made for a motion controller. Um, so, and I've, I've always liked those style of games um, on the Wii. Uh, uh, like Resident Evil 4, I think, is a great way of how you can use that that style of, of controller in a shooter. Um, so anyway, I really wanted to play Extraction, and I had, I had avoided any spoilers and, uh, again, going to uh, reading reviews of the game. Um, I had actually read a couple different reviews that had said Extraction, even though it's a ported Wii game, is still the best reason to own a move controller. Um, so I said screw it and went out and actually kind of got a move controller just because I, I really wanted to, to play Extraction because I wanted more Dead Space. So... Yeah, I uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I was I was a little frustrated at times because some of the things that it wants you to grab are on screen for sometimes seemingly less than a second. Uh, yeah, the pickups um, in that game are are if if you're someone who needs to pick up everything, that game can make you, like thank goodness you can play by chapter. Yeah, that, and that <laughs> but and that's when I realized that the game is really meant to be played over and over again. Yeah. Um. And and I once I got comfortable, I I really enjoyed that game. Um. And I. I was, I'll tell you this, when I had, I had played the first chapter, the first chapter you just play as a mine worker in a suit similar to Isaac's, uh, you're extracting the marker for the first time, it's a prequel to the original Dead Space, the people around you start to go insane, they start jumping at you and trying to kill you, uh, your own friends try to kill you, uh, you later learn that you yourself are going insane and you've actually, at least in some cases, have been killing innocent people. Uh, and the, the the first level ends with the police shooting you to death because they have just partially witnessed you murdering innocent people. From what I had seen in the first Dead Space, I already knew that none of these people were going to survive. And yeah. I was like, the I was I was thinking to myself, this is going to be a bleak game. Um, but I I still want to see it because it's it's made by the same people. It's it's. It's going to advance the the Dead Space fiction. I, I'm really enjoying the Dead Space fiction right now, so I need some of this. So, um, yeah, I mean, well, I guess we can get into the ending and stuff later. But I was I I, I did end up enjoying those characters, and I'm very glad that uh they they at least most of them survived. And I was actually that was a bit of a a really happy ending for me because I was ex- especially in the last chapter when you were all getting on that shuttle. I'm still th- I'm still waiting for the the tragic moment where they all die and don't get off. Yeah, me too. And then when they flew off, I'm like, wait, what? They made it? <laughs> this isn't supposed to be how this game ends. Yeah, I, there's I, no I, easy mirror survivors. What is this? I went into that and, game thinking it was going to be like Halo Reach of like you're going into this game knowing everyone's going to yes, die pretty much. Yes, and, that, mm. and, yeah. and I got so, attached. Like I did not I was trying like I was like I don't care about these characters. Pff. But then I was like, you know, Nate McNeil's pretty cool. Lexine is pretty cool. And then like, you know, Gabe Weller is a friggin' badass. Um halfway through the game, I was sitting there going like, I don't want Gabe Weller to die. He's too cool. He's he's like I would play another game with Gabe Weller. This guy this guy is like a really good survival horror protagonist because the dude is on task the whole time. Um, I really dig him, and uh, I was I, th- I was just really surprised because you know for all like I I love Isaac Clarke, but I actually I think got a little bit more attached to the 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 cast of Extraction over the course of that game. I'm not sure why. Uh, mm-hmm. I just I really got into them. Like something really stuck with me, and I was like, man, like I I really enjoy these characters, and uh, I was also thinking about like. 
in Dead Space, you know, this is the big thing, is that the if you take the first name of every chapter of Dead Space, it forms the, the phrase, Nicole is dead. And then over the course of the levels that form the word dead, every one of those levels, a main character dies. So once I hit what I felt like were the final levels, um, I noticed that whenever you assume the guys are somebody who wasn't Nate McNeil, up until that point, often they would end up getting killed somehow. And then there was the level where they finally put you into the guise of Gabe Weller. And I actually went like, oh, no. Like, I'm seeing things from Gabe Weller's perspective. <laughs> oh, no. And then at the end of it, when he when, when he's like, like, when you catch that dude sending the message to the unitologists and he walks up to watch the message, the whole time I was sitting there, I almost couldn't look at the screen. I was like, Gabe, <laughs> turn around. He's freaking, he's going to kill yeah. you. Turn around. Yeah. I was getting really freaked out. <laughs> yeah, I really, I really expected that next chapter to, for you to just find Gabe's body there and mm. to still not know exactly what happened other than there's two dead people in this room now. Yeah. I see. I, I assumed he was going to either be mauled by a necromorph or be turned into a necromorph and you have the horrible task of killing him. I, yeah, I was so freaked. I was like, I was like, I, you know, Nate and Lexine are the main characters, obviously, for the most part of Extraction. But Gabe Weller was like, he was, for a guy who started off feeling like, oh, he's the, he's the gruff security guy who's going to get killed at some point early on. The fact that he kept surviving, kept going, kept expanding, kept, you know, sort of growing. Um, and then getting up to that point, I actually was just getting really worked up. I was like, you better not, you better make sure Gabe Weller goes out like a badass here. You don't get it. Don't, don't have me watch this monitor. Then suddenly have like blood splatter in front of it. Cause he got shot in the back of the head or something. Um, yeah. And, and I Speak, speaking of badasses though, Nate at the end. Good God. Oh my God. Yeah. Like, again, I don't mean to come. I, I'm not saying this to make Isaac Clark look bad because Isaac Clark does some pretty badass stuff himself. But Nate McNeil, especially at the end, when, when you're faced with that moment and you're, you're sitting there like, oh man, like you're, you're out in the ship and basically the slug Leviathan thing from Dead Space One has shot a needle through your hand and it's stuck your hand to the ship and you, you have a very limited time to, uh, to get out of there because your air is running out and stuff like that. And then I realized with like five seconds left, it's like melee target pointing at your own arm. And I'm like, wait a second. And so you, I'm sitting there just waving the stick. I'm like, oh my God. And he's cutting his own arm off. And then when he shows up in the end, when you're, you're escaping back into the shuttle, I was, and, and friggin' Gabe Weller is still alive. And then Nate McNeil comes around with one arm and a huge gun. And I'm yes, like, it's, yeah, that, that's, it was, that was so badass because you're, you're waiting on him. You're waiting on him. You're waiting on him. You're waiting on him. He's, you know, he's accomplished his mission, but he's he never returned. So eventually, the characters are like, if we if we don't leave, we're all gonna die. We can't wait for him any longer. The dude, you hear you hear an explosion, and then you turn around, and here's Nate running backwards with one arm, holding a contact beam, blowing everything up in retreat, and saying, "Let's get out of here." <laughs> it was glorious. Yeah, and and that's I think what I love about Extraction is that. It was a very different atmosphere than the first Dead Space games, but not in a bad way. It was like, there were survivors on the Ishimura. They were friggin' superheroes. And that's why they were, like, it really legitimized that those guys made it off. Because I was like, it's gonna suck if it's just like, you know, either everyone dies, or it's like, all these chumps got off the Ishimura and nobody remembered. It's like, no, a couple, a, a, a trio of superhumans made it off the Ishimura. And they made it off because they were friggin' superhumans. They were like action movie stars who happened to be on the ship at the time. It was, I, I love that. <laughs> um, Andy, let's let's just pop over to Andy now because Andy, um, I I think you said you have you played it or did you just watch a playthrough of Extraction? Uh, I I played it on on YouTube. Ah, unfortunately, yeah, uh, right. I did get the PlayStation version, but once I I was not willing to drop. Uh, what sixty pounds or whatever it is, or whatever it costs here for the move, because I had, like I, I said, uh, bought a Wii uh, mm. to play Resident Evil, and then pretty much played nothing for it. I didn't want to do that again with a uh, a wand, a magic and, stick with a ball on. And I will say, very sadly, I, I'm still waiting for another game to use my move yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the only reason why I didn't do it because I was like. I appreciate that they're throwing on this free game, but like Gog said, you can't play a real shooter with sticks and have a fun time. No, if you it's... can, that's cool, but I, I, I wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah. I find it a drag. Cool. Just I was yeah. fort I was fortunate because I had I had played I had bought Resident Evil Five Gold Edition before the move was out. Um I basically just played through it on the normal difficulty 
and had moved on. Uh, they later patched the gold edition to include move support. So after I'd beat Dead Space 2 and some other games and didn't really have anything to go back to, I'm like, oh yeah, like I loved Resident Evil 4 with the Wii controller. Um, I was actually a little apprehensive about playing 5 on the dual sticks because I loved the motion control so much. Um, and that actually led to a very long time where I replayed that game several times trying to get achievements and unlocks and stuff. So I, I did, I have really gotten a lot out of my move controller, but I'm kind of done with Resident Evil 5, I think, for the most mm. part. I've, 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 I've done most of what I want to do with that, and yeah, now I'm kind of in the position like, well, at least I got two games out of it, but well, it's, it's, it's a really neat technology. It works yeah. really, really well. I've, yeah. I've never had really any problem with it. Just a couple times it's, it's become unsynced and done something really weird, and I've had to reboot my game. That's been really rare, and uh, I think the technology is sound. It just—it's it's great motion. I don't control. have anything to use it with. Like, like I've—it I, has really high fidelity. It's—I'm surprised because I thought the move looked really dorky. It still does look really dorky, <laughs> but it's got really good motion control. Someone needs to program some games for it to work with because all I got is I got I got Dead Space Extraction, and I will say this: the the sports game that is packed in with the move bundle is actually quite good. Um, I really is like it. Is there anything else for it, bar those three games? Um, is, yeah, is that got, pretty much it? You got Resident Evil 5, you got you got Dead Space Extraction, you got the sports game pack-in. Um, mm -hmm. I have yet to see anything else with move support that I'd actually want to play with the move. <laughs> right. Uh, I hear Killzone 3 has move support. I don't know how that turned mm. out. Um, I had a lot of fun watching the Giant Bomb quick look of move support for the, the, the Deathly Hollows uh, Harry Potter game. But I don't know if I'd actually <laughs> want to go through that myself. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, do, if, if you're going to buy a move for Dead Space Extraction, be prepared for a little bit of buyer's regret afterwards. Because it's so good for Dead Space Extraction. But that is, at the end of the day, a game. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I pretty much watched it all on YouTube. Uh, the problem with watching it on YouTube is Gog was really, really excited about playing uh, Extraction. And uh, usually, when me and Gog have talked on on Skype, he's uh, he's usually been playing a game, and he was <laughs> like, for instance, he was going, "Oh my god, oh my god, he's cutting off his own arm! Why am I doing this? <laughs> like, what, what's going on, Gog? It's like, I'm cutting off my own arm, Andy. It's like, okay, <laughs> how's that going for you? So a lot of the uh, the twists and stuff, I I already knew about because uh, mm. you know G Gog was really excited, and uh, you know I I wasn't gonna play it, so I was happy to yeah. To, I, to I, hear I, about I already it. knew that Andy had bought Dead Space with Extraction, played Dead Space Two, and then sold the game back without having played Extraction. So I knew that yeah. he didn't care. Mm -hmm. No, I, I I enjoyed watching it, but I think <laughs> if if I'm honest, I would have got a lot more out of it if I had played it, which isn't that surprising. It's a game. What do you yeah. expect? Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, um, from what you saw of Extraction, like, uh, was there anything that really stuck out to you in there as a surprise at all? Just uh, The it, characters. It, it, the yeah. characters shocked the hell out of me, because no knock against Dead Space, but it's not known for its uh, strong characters, and that's had the strongest characters in that I've seen so far, because <laughs> you look at the animated movies, and, yeah, uh, we may touch on them, but they don't really have strong characters. Uh, Dead Space 2, you could argue, has a couple of uh, okay characters, but I think Extraction really stood out for their their actual characters. Like, I like the Unitologist dude as well, mainly because he, <laughs> he was South African. Unfortunately, <laughs> when I hear the South African accent, I, I hear prawns. I hear him saying prawns <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and it doesn't help when the Necromorphs have the little uh, strings coming out of the mouth. I'm like, it's it's a big prawn. <laughs> I think one of the strengths of Extraction in his characters is that it uses the first-person perspective to really just make you get in touch with them. Like it, it kind of forces you to sort of to to come along with them for the ride and and really kind of feel for their situation in a way that I wasn't expecting out of a real yeah, shooter. Yeah, that is true. Like you're, you're, it's you're, it's not just a static screen. You feel like you are in the the in, in for the most part Nate's shoes, and and like you'll be going down an elevator, and he'll be looking at each of his you know, quote unquote partners one by one. And you just see like the stress and distress in their face and emotion. And yeah. you, you, you really do feel, um, 
as if you are you are in the situation with those people and the, yeah and it, it, man it, it yeah I, it, they did such a good job too because it was built as a Wii game um mm-hmm. and the the original Dead Space was what PS3 PC and Xbox 360 right mm-hmm. so that's a pretty major at least graphically backstep to to port that to the Wii I still think they did such a fantastic job of just really pushing the Wii's limits as far as the character models and immersion and stuff like that. Well, so, as, as I understand it, it because as well. it was it was kind of like the same environment, but now you're having to kind of downgrade the visuals, and they still pulled it off. I think, as I understand it, though the uh, the PS3 version had a little bit of a graphical facelift, uh, just slightly, like it's called Extraction HD. Um, okay. And as I understand it, uh, it, it did. I don't think they did like full new models or anything, but I, I, as I understand it, they did a little bit of graphical facelifting to make it look a bit more on par. Um, certainly not on par with Dead Space 2's visuals, but they, they, they pushed it up a little bit just because it's only going to be on okay. the PS3 and then mm-hmm. okay. the Xbox. So I know at the very least they had to make it widescreen, but yeah, yeah. But uh, no, I mean, I think one of the strengths of it was just whoever designed it really got what a rail shooter is and really got how to – it's the camera work, I think. Like you said, when when you're in Nate's shoes and he keeps looking back at everyone and making sure they're still there and still all right, like you really got into it. You're like, yeah, I yeah, hope they're and still even, there. Like when he's crawling through the vents and he, he'll, he'll go – he'll make a push. He'll make a push. Then he'll stop and turn around to make sure there's nothing behind him because yeah. if you were playing the original Dead Space – that's exactly what you would be doing. If you're in a hallway, you'd walk, you'd walk, and you're always going to be, you know, systematically, periodically checking behind you just to make sure that there's nothing weird going on. And mm. he's doing that, and you're not controlling it. And it's just you, you really, you really do kind of feel that he's that he is feeling the same things that you would as a player if you were actually controlling the camera. Mm-hmm. That really built up the tension as well, because you're like, because it's a rail shooter and it's a horror rail shooter. Every time this character could turn around, they could have put something there to scare you, to make you jump. Yeah, and, and also Extraction, I think, just like the original Dead Space and Dead Space Two, did a really good job of not getting gluttonous on its jump scares. Yeah, like it did. It didn't. It didn't just start getting like the, this. Is the thing I have, I haven't played through the game, but what I've heard is that. If there was going to be a criticism about um, like the fear games, it's that fear games, as I understand it, get a little bit crutched on the, on jump scares to some degree. Um, as I said, I haven't actually played them, but I've I've read that criticism here and there. Um, and Dead Space totally does not get hung up on jump scares. They happen. There are monster closets, as they're as they've been called here and there, but. Uh, a lot of it comes from other factors that up the creepiness, and I think that Extraction also does a good job of that. Like, even even in the biggest drag of the game, which to me was the sewer level, just because it just kept going on, um, it doesn't really, you know, it, it doesn't keep you scared by having things just burst up out of the water in front of you. It's just, it has this constant dread that you're stuck in the sewers with just, you don't know how many necromorphs are there. Uh and and also, just, as I said before, the I think one other thing I like about the game is how it would put you in other characters' shoes, at least briefly, and in a way that made you very scared for characters. Like uh, when you when you play as uh, when you're stuck with the Ripper playing as that scientist lady, um, yeah, and and you realize like I, I love how they 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 took her out because it's kind of like it both revealed you know the obvious thing that that unitologist guy was both a unitologist and very dangerous to have along with you, but it also mm-hmm. even tied back to the uh, to to the tentacles in the vents. Yeah. The, that's what gets her, and I was like, "Oh man, they're, like they're they're going right back into that." Like, <laughs> and and she's stuck with a ripper. And if you've played against those tentacles, you'd know that there are some guns that are not quite as effective against them as others. And uh, I don't know. I like how that played out. Um, Gog, was there anything uh, else extraction wise you'd like to bring up? Um. Uh, how, I'm trying to think. I was, how, I was so I was so enthralled in your conversation. The, <laughs> I, uh, the um the the, uh, the way that they handled the controls, I thought was was really well done. Mm. Um, they really used the the move controller, I think, in interesting ways. Maybe maybe not anything different than other move or motion control type games do, but like being able to navig- navigate that ripper blade in all three dimensions was really satisfying. I, I was about I, to ask you how you felt about the ripper physics yeah, and extraction. I love, yeah, <laughs> I, I love the uh, 
I love the the Ripper and Extraction is easily my favorite weapon, and especially combined with Stasis. It's just oh, um, it's so good. Um, like the the ability to switch your alternate mode just by rotating your wrist a bit. So good. Was so good because yeah. that was that's one thing that I always seem to do in the thick of battle in both Dead Space and Dead Space Two is I'd always like accidentally hit like the um the 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 switch alternate mode or whatever and I I and then like something would come out of my gun that I wasn't expecting then it would <laughs> then it would completely throw me off of like wait am I hitting the wrong button and I'm in the middle of a battle and with with extraction it was very satisfying to just be able to just twist your wrist shoot the alt mode you know twist it back and you and then you're back and and it even gave you like the little visual screen or visual cue on screen and the little sound that it made when you were switching between modes was was really well done um uh yeah it was i and it, they ma- they really managed to take a lot of the 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 established like design elements and and te- and tactics and and gizmos like stasis and kinesis and that sort of stuff and it really ported well cuz it it all plays completely differently on a motion controller obviously but they still managed to make it feel like it was the exact same thing uh, definitely um, and yeah. and i never even really used kinesis that much in um in the main game proper it, with the exception of maybe just like reaching out and grabbing some ammo um but i found myself a lot more comfortable with it using the motion controller but it still felt like it was like i was I could have easily been Isaac using my kinesis in this room, but I was doing it with a compl- in a completely different way using a completely different type of controller in a completely different type of game. But mm-hmm. they still they still really managed through clever use of motion controls to make me feel like I was still in the same universe using the same equipment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it was re- it was really cool to me how I felt like <clears throat> I, I was worried that I was going to get the feeling that I was just using. Uh, rail shooter guns with dead space names attached to them, and I did not feel that at all. Um, especially with stasis being in there, stasis was was great in extraction. Uh, really helped out a lot, um, and, and it all added to the feel of making it feel like a dead space game first than a rail shooter. Um, I'm trying to think what else we can bring up here about extraction. Um, I don't know. I think you guys uh, played it the right way as well because. During the walkthrough, the, the the person I watched played it single player for most of it, and then right at the end got two players, and it becomes really, really unbalanced when you have two people playing that at once, because oh, you basically yeah. then have six stasis shots, plus you have two guns going. So that, that game is not meant for two players, it's meant for one person to, it, to go through it. If anything, if you're playing the game as two players, it's more like you're playing as a heavily armed single player. Kind of. Yeah. Like it's, at least in terms of the game's fiction, that's what it looks like to me. Is that all of a sudden Nate now is dual wielding guns and somehow having double kinesis and double stasis built into his arms or something like that? Like he's turned into a crazy cyborg Nate or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the um, I think we've covered extraction pretty well. Um, the only other thing was I thought it was, it was it was it was really really cool to to be able to see Nicole prior to the events. Like yeah. when 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 you when you sneak aboard the Ishimura because they're trying to keep everybody off and they're actually opening fire on ships you guys that your team manages to to get on the ship um anyway uh and then you're kind of put into a quarantine for a bit and it's like oh look it's Nicole that makes sense she's a medical officer she wants to make sure you're okay before you're on the ship um and it, i think it like her her suicide even had a little bit more of a tragicness because you saw it coming, but you, you see her, she still seems to be a bit, uh, naive of the events going on around her. And, but you know, her, you know, her fate, you know, it's sealed and just, yeah. you know, going from mm. point A to point B was a little bit sad. And and she sounds just like when I found when I, when, when you're interacting with her, she just sounds like she's trying really hard to, to be, you know, a, a helpful medical officer. Like she's trying really hard to make sure everyone's feeling Okay. But you can kind of feel this, like, you know, you can feel her wall breaking down as you're speaking to her. And then that moment when uh, when Nate and Lexine, you know, find her transmission and then they try speaking to her and they're like, oh, no, she's, you know, she's she's on the, what is it, like, 
outward signal only or something like that. Like she can't receive any audio herself and they're watching her. And it's just, you feel when, when in that moment, it's like, there's one tragedy to, to her death scene message when you're in the position of Isaac. And it was a completely different tragedy from the, the position of Nate and Lexine. Cause you're seeing, you're seeing this happen and you're kind of like, Oh man, like they're, they're literally, they're reacting to it as it's happening. And it, it was surprisingly powerful to me to a degree, not, not, you mm-hmm. know, like high drama or anything, but it, it left an effect I didn't expect to feel. Yeah. The, um, oh, I can't, I can't believe I didn't bring this up before. The, the other thing that it did really well was uh, the game establishes that there's something special about Lexine. Um, that, that specialness is somehow she is immune to the psychotic effects of the marker. Mm-hmm. Um, for some reason, those that are around her are also immune. The game does a really cool thing because at the end, the the South African unitologist guy, you see him basically giving a report stating as such. And then it, it kind of hits you, because especially if you go through the game and play again. Um, wh- when you're as Nate, uh, especially before you find Lexine... You start seeing the symbols, and you start seeing the, some of the same things that the guy that you played in level one saw mm-hmm. before he went crazy and killed everyone. Now, it doesn't happen that often, but the times that it does happen, like there's another part a couple chapters later where Nate goes off on his own to scout for a bit. When he's off on his own, he's seeing symbols and seeing weird stuff. The game never explicitly tells you, like, it you know it just seems to happen at random, but once that guy makes the reveal, you're like, oh yeah, like whenever I whenever my character is off doing his own mission and Le- and he's not with with the other crew specifically Lexine, you start seeing that stuff. And I just I thought that was really clever, mm-hmm. in that you you do see that stuff, but in the you, 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 unless I mean you're not going to really think about like oh what's happening at this moment it's happening not it's just you your character randomly starts seeing some weird stuff, but so does everybody else in dead space. Yeah. And it's, it's just, I don't know. I, I, that really, that really kind of hit me when he did that. I'm like, Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that, I don't know. I thought that, I thought that was kind of clever and we, we really don't know that much about Lexine. Um, especially Chris hasn't cause he hasn't played severed yet, but yeah, the, uh, <laughs> I'll get to my reasons for that when we get to severed's. Yeah. <laughs> <original> <laughs> but the, um, but yeah, I, 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 I thought that was I thought that was 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 really cool how it they they just they they subtly played these events out and never explained it to you and then at the end when you real, realize it and I'm sure with a lot of people it probably just flew over their heads because they're like I don't care I just want to kill more necromorphs but like that that really resonated with me of how clever they they pulled that and and not not really not really saying it but you if you were if you were really observant you you could you could piece it together if you want. Yeah. Mm. Um yeah, I, I the the whole the whole way they played the plot in extraction I thought was pretty cool because as it all plays back into the whole thing of extraction could have just been oh no, everything's coming down and now all these characters are going to die because we're just seeing what happens before Isaac Clark shows up. And instead, they crafted a pretty intriguing little story with some really strong characters that that suck you in. Um the only other thing that that I really want to bring up is just uh, from what what got me to really want to play Extraction was actually the the Giant Bomb Quick Look because seeing the way that they they got across the feeling of when everything goes nuts in that opening level and like you go out into the into the the plaza and everyone's just killing each other I thought that that actually was a really cool uh, way of playing it like it really made you see like all right this is what went down and I buy that this is what went down um, it was cool I, I really like Extraction. <laughs> I think it's probably worth mentioning as well how well it actually ties into uh, events that you have to either recreate or fix because of what you do in extraction. For Mm. instance, like the asteroid uh, defense system, you have to turn that off in extraction because if you leave, the plasma cannons will blow you up. Yeah. Uh, So one of your missions is to go to the room that Isaac Clark goes to to turn them on to specifically break it and turn it <laughs> off, which I thought was quite fun. And there are a couple of other things in that game, like moving the marker. Uh, mm. Obviously, that is the end sequence of, of Dead Space 1, and in, in Extraction, it's the first thing you ever do. It's the, You move the marker, 
and you get it out of there just like uh it, it's it's nice how that is kind of flip flopped around mm-hmm. and uh you visit a lot of cool spots that you know in dead space one well, how many it was either a year or a couple of months after uh dead space came out wasn't it i think it was the next year extraction. Yeah, so that was a, a nice way as well to revisit the Ishimura. Like you yeah. said, it interacts with Nicole, and you get to see the outgoing message. One of the good things about that uh, extraction, because you mentioned that they could have just slapped on a story uh, waiting for Isaac Clarke, they did that. It was called Downfall, which was the first animated movie. If you've seen that, yeah. <laughs> you could argue that that's very much extraction, but extraction is the far superior because it's just a team of people on the ship trying to survive yeah. who then die at the end. Yeah, d- downfall it, is like it downfall represents what I was worried extraction would be. Yes, yeah. that, that's exactly especially after the first chapter. I, I literally <laughs> thought every chapter, like I was gonna I, I was like, I'm not gonna get attached to these people because every other chapter my character is gonna die until I'm like the last <laughs> person on the Ishimura who's gonna literally probably like I, I will probably turn into one of the first necromorphs that ends up killing Isaac or something. You know, I I just I th- I thought it was going to be like that, and that's why I literally just stared at the screen when I'm like, "What? The, they they can't be leaving. That that's not supposed to happen. Everybody's dead." So, yeah, yeah I, it was I, it was a very pleasant ending for me that I didn't expect, mm-hmm. I, which I, is weird since this was a prequel, and you 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 you'd think you knew exactly what you're supposed to expect. Such a exactly. good prequel as well. There are very few prequels that are this good. Yeah, and and I think a lot of people may be writing off Extraction as both a rail shooter and a prequel, and I would tell people like, no, it's it's a very strong entry uh, in Dead Space's fiction. Um, really worth playing. That, that's that's it was part of one of my main goals and wanted to, in this recording even was I wanted to talk the hell up out of Extraction because I dug that game really hardcore. <laughs> but um, for now, let's 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 uh, you know we've said we've said I think a lot about Extraction and how really cool it was. Let's uh, move into the the one that, that brought in a lot of attention, Dead Space 2. Premature completion of Archive Zero 2. Stay tuned for both the remainder of Archive Zero 2 and a reconvening of severed parties for Dead Space 2. 